All right, good morning, everyone. A day next to last. And um, we're going to start today by concluding agenda item D5. And for that, I'll hand the gavel to Vice Chair Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Grolnick. And uh, with that, we'll all turn to uh, Robin Elke to uh, get us restarted on uh, D5. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And with that, I'll hand it over to. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so all we have to do this morning is uh, hear from the STT on their uh, second report and um, yeah, close this agenda up after that. So that's um, my summary. Very good. Thank you. And uh, Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Uh, I'll be referring to Agenda Item D5A, Supplemental STT Report 2. Um, I'm, I'll just cut to the chase and uh, move to Table 5 on page 18. Uh, there are still uh, a number of Puget Sound Chinook stocks that are not meeting their objectives. Um, and then uh, on page 19, um, again, uh, as was discussed yesterday, Oco Fall is uh, not meeting its objective at the current time. And uh, for the remainder of the Chinook stocks and the Coho stocks, uh, they all meet their uh, objectives um, based on the guidance provided yesterday. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, questions on the SCT report? Um, Guidance potentially. Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks to the STT for doing an extra um, round of model runs under D5. I do not have any guidance on council fisheries this morning. Uh, we made some significant process uh, progress overnight in the North of Falcon process, and um, if I could just ask the STT to hold off on a final final model run for D6 while the USV Washington, Washington co-managers work through the last inside issues. I think we can have them a set of um, inside fishery inputs later this morning that will solve the problems Dr. O'Farrell highlighted with not meeting conservation objectives in Puget Sound. Okay, very good. Thank you. Oregon, you're good. Okay, California, okay. Joe, Joe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no guidance at this point. Okay, very good. All right. Robin, I'll turn back to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'm wondering if we have any public comment. I don't think it was. But all right, thank you. Uh, so with that, I think we have concluded agenda item D5 and we'll um, hope to see you later this afternoon for agenda item D6. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. All right, with that, I'll turn the gavel back to uh, Chair Grolick to get us going here. It's a well-traveled gavel. Well, we'll give uh, folks a minute. We do have a changing of the seats a ritual that happens when we change FMPs. So we'll just pause for a few moments here to allow folks to get situated.
<clears throat> okay. Well, let's get started with our regularly um, scheduled program of the day. And we'll get started with uh, Grand Fish item F7, electronic monitoring update. And for that, I'll, we'll, I'll turn to Staff Officer Brett Weedoff to get us started. Good morning, council members. This is agenda item F7, electronic monitoring update. Uh, I'll just review the situation summary and then we'll can turn to Ryan to give the NIMS report and then we'll look to uh, Phil Anderson to summarize the jump pack report and then we'll turn to the gap and any public comments. So back in November 2021, the council revised the membership of the ad hoc ground fish electronic monitoring policy advisory and the technical advisory committees and then uh, scheduled up the program review. Uh, for today, the, the update. And so um, NIMS has provided that uh, report. The GEMPAC and the TAC had met twice uh, back in February and March and discussed uh, the issues at hand. And so um, we've developed the GEMPAC report for the briefing book today. Uh, the council action today is to provide guidance on the issues, the priorities, and the workload, and then schedule for continued program development. So. Uh, that's your task today. A lot of discussion about next steps I think is going to happen here and think about the future and what we're going to work on for the next uh, six to eight to 12 months and see where we can uh, solve some problems and get this electronic monitoring uh, program off the ground. So uh, that's really just my overview. Any questions on that? If not, then we can just go ahead and turn to Ryan. All right. Thank you. Any questions? for Brett on the overview. All right, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'll be reading from Supplemental NIMS Report 1. <clears throat> so in the Council's July letter to NIMS, uh, you identified three topic areas for us to investigate uh, when you requested the delay of the EM uh, regulatory program. <clears throat> the first was utilizing cost recovery uh, to fund the EM video review. The second was utilizing the sole source authority um, for a grant contract or, or other mechanisms for video review by Pacific States. <clears throat> and the last was clarifications regarding confidentiality and federal record retention. <clears throat> we have worked uh, since that time to have quite a number of discussions, both at the regional uh, and the national level to try and get um, some answers for you on these issues, um, especially by this meeting, given that we're now um, into the first year of that two-year delay. <clears throat> so starting with the use of cost recovery, um, the NIMS catch share policy uh, was published in 2017. Uh, it was the follow-on on from a draft policy in 2010. So it was quite a lot of public comment period, <clears throat> broad input to NOAA from the public and stakeholders. Um, and in the creation and development of the catch share policy, and one of the policy's guiding principles is that incremental government costs for management, data collection, and analysis and enforcement of LAP programs <clears throat> shall be recovered by uh, from participants as required by the MSA. Uh, so it states this a couple times in the catch share policy, the cost recovery aims to recover a variety of government costs. Uh, and it's clear that this principle was developed through that public process and they demonstrate NIMS's resulting interpretation of the cost recovery provisions in the Magnuson Act. There's a second procedural directive, um, the cost allocation in EM programs which states that 4EM programs industry will be responsible for the sampling costs <clears throat> of such programs. The cost allocation procedural directive further states though that NIMS uh, is authorized, like I just stated, to recover costs associated with LAPS and in such fisheries we may collect fees from industry to pay for administrative costs, sampling costs, or both. So here the inclusion of sampling costs is in conflict with the catch share policy. Uh, since those are industry's responsibility. Um, but because the use of cost recovery is contradictory to the catch share policy, a review and a change to, well, either one of those policies well, would be required to 
make the use of cost recovery for EM video review consistent with both. Uh, and to do a, such a change to a national policy that will require a process for public comment, uh, an assessment on how any changes in that policy would impact other regions and fisheries, as well as a detailed justification and rationale for why such a change to NIMS policy is needed and consistent with the original intent of the policy. Um, <clears throat> this has happened before in, in all cases, just like uh, I described for the creation of those policies initially, uh, this is at the least usually a multi-year process. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, using the MSA sole source authority. So the second question, we did have initial discussions on this with our Western Acquisitions Division of the Acquisition and Grants Office. Um, as you know, although it, 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 this clause is in the Magnuson Act when it's discussing funds that are coming from NIMPS to a state um, <clears throat> commission, it does involve all sorts of other uh, conversations um, regarding ethics and other other. Um, legal aspects, but during this informal review, we actually did not identify barriers to use sole source authority. Um, however, of course, <clears throat> we would officially review and determine this if there was a detailed package submitted. Uh, and just to clarify here, <clears throat> so therefore, um, the answer on sole source, we believe based on this informal review is we could have used that <clears throat> if we were able to use cost recovery funds, uh, and therefore the money was coming from NIMS to Pacific States or if there was appropriations given to NIMS, um, and then you could use that sole source authority mechanism. For the confidentiality and federal record retention, um, the council has seen this. We've discussed uh, this document that's expected to be finalized soon uh, and presented to the CCC next month. Um, the NIMS will be sharing this document um, as widely as we can as soon as it is ready uh, for the May CCC and usually that's a little bit of time before the, the meeting is scheduled to take place which is in mid-May. Um, <clears throat> so we don't have uh, any further information on that now but we'll share the final document as soon as it is ready within the coming weeks. Regarding the EFP extension um, we're in, based on all of these conversations that we had regarding those other three, uh, we also had conversations about the um, extension that we did and wanted to express this to the council as early as possible as well as this was a result of another result of those discussions. Um, the intent of those EFPs was to allow adequate time to address the concerns that I just walked through, which we now have answers to. We think further extension would undermine the purpose of ESPs, which is for limited development of a new program um, <clears throat> and could deprive the public of the opportunity for input that occurs in the regular fishery management process and notice and comment rulemaking. So for these reasons, NIMS will not extend the EFPs beyond December 31st, 2023, uh, and therefore a regulatory program must be in place in order for EM to continue as a monitoring option. So given all of that above rationale and the time frame needed to complete a program and regulation, we don't see a path forward using cost recovery funds to pay for EM video re review and storage. Um, I will note that this is not just a decision that is coming to the Pacific Council. Um, this is a decision across NIMS. So um, when you mentioned the delay, there was a lot of reference in your letter to the North Pacific model. Uh, the North Pacific will also be moving forward uh, with a, a pathway that does not involve using cost recovery funds. Um, that said, um, whether you want it in parallel or otherwise, if you, if the council wanted to recommend moving down the path of changing the policies, uh, we, at least we've laid out here uh, the process for that. Uh, compelling case would need to be made, taking the intent and the policies in account, considering the national implications and provide sufficient justification and rationale for why that change is consistent with the original intent or is needed at this time. Uh, so that concludes my report. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. Are there any questions on the NIMS report? Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Ryan, could you just repeat that last that last statement you made about the intent and this? I, I just missed I missed the full of what you were saying there. Yeah, Chair. Thanks, Corey, for the question. So, 
if, if to pursue a process to change a national policy, it, it, you need to go through that very robust public process. And if you open up one aspect of the policy, you open up everything <clears throat> across the country. And so in order to make a case for whatever change in the policy we would like to see, you need to make a compelling case for that takes into account the intent of the policies, the, can, it's the implications, not just regionally, but nationally of such a change, and sufficient justification and rationale for either why that policy change is either consistent with the original intent or is, is needed at this time uh, and should be changed for that manner. I hope that clarifies. Further questions? Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we'll now go to the uh, Jim Pack report and Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be referring to agenda item F7A, the supplemental Jim Pack slash TAC report one. As you'll recall at the November 2021 meeting, the council reconstituted the uh, ground fish electronic monitoring policy and technical advisory committees and charged them with finding solutions to the issues that have been identified by industry associated with the draft implementing regulations. Uh, we've begun our work um, and we've held uh, two meetings um, since, since uh, November that I'll uh, walk through here uh, as I give this report. The primary purpose of our first meeting was to ensure that we had a common understanding of the primary purpose of an electronic monitoring program uh, and to identify the outstanding issues that we felt needed to be addressed to achieve that outcome. We also wanted to identify next steps and make assignments as necessary to bring the needed information back to our uh, uh, second meeting uh, to ensure that we were making timely progress toward addressing uh, the outstanding issues that we identified through our conversation. The first thing that we did is just to make sure we were all on the same page in terms of what our what the primary purpose of an EM program is. Uh, and uh, we concluded in our discussion that it is to create a more cost effective method to verify that logbook entries are accurate uh, than a system that relies on having human observers aboard or on board. We would then went through a fairly systematic discussion in terms of identifying issues, some of which were uh, related to policies of National Marine Fishery Service, as Mr. Wolf just Mr. Wolf just spoke to, and the need to have those resolved before we could make progress and identify paths forward to uh, get at the problems that that were associated with those policies. And as um, Brian just mentioned, the cost recovery, the use of cost recovery funds were, were, we needed a decision on that. We needed to know whether that was an option for us or not. And as, as uh, Brian just mentioned, they, they are not available to us in this, for this purpose. We needed to understand the issues associated with sole source contracting and the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. We needed to understand uh, what um, what acceptable pathways there might be um, for providing industry funding to Pacific states to offset their costs for the video review and data storage. We also wanted to understand whether we had uh, the potential of, of uh, using EM beyond 2023 in the event that um, uh, we weren't able to get all of the issues resolved and, and put into place in time for the January 2023 timeframe. There was also a number of sampling and data handling and processing protocols that, that are out there uh, and we needed to solve uh, and, uh, those outstanding issues. 
And then there was the matter of interim funding to get us through 2022 and 2023. And um, so those were the primary issues that, that we identified. We, re we reconvened at a second meeting here at the end of March. Um, the primary purpose of this meeting was to hear and discuss responses that we received from NIMS on those key policy questions, get an update from Pacific States, and to determine one or more viable scenarios to reduce the overall cost and provide flexibility for the EM program. I know I'm repeating myself a bit and what Ryan is, but I'll just continue to walk through this here. We, um, uh, the catch air policy was discussed. We understood from the conclusion of the report we got back from NIMS that couldn't use that. Um, we got answers, as Ryan mentioned, to our sole source contracting uh, and with the understanding that it is available to us, but it's only available to us if the funds are coming through National Marine Fisheries Service to Pacific States. And we got a, um, a pretty hard no on the issue, on the question about using EM past 2023. And while uh, these are our words, not NIMS, that it's not completely out of the realm of possibility given some new circumstances that uh, if given the current set of circumstances, that wouldn't be an option for us. We also learned from Pacific States uh, that their costs have been increasing to an estimate of 600,000 in 2023, which is up from 500K uh, this year. And that was due to the need to hire additional reviewers for the West Coast program. Staffing shortages and other factors has put uh, Pacific States behind on some of the review. And uh, we also uh, talked about the three-week turnaround requirement from NIMPS based on the current EM program manual. So, okay, so given all that, where are we going? How can, how can we move forward here on and get us to a point where we have a cost-effective EM program and ready to go for 2023 under a set of regulations? So we established a couple of what we're calling a, a, a um, subset of committee members that are going to work on two uh, primary areas of uh, issues. The first uh, is that we are we have a subset of our committee that's going to meet with PSMFC leadership to discuss potential pathways that industry funding could be used to offset PSMFC costs in a man in a manner that maintains what we characterized as an arm's length separation that avoids conflict of interest issues that the commission has identified. We established a different subset of committee members that are going to meet uh, with an appropriate cross-section of NIMS and PSMFC staff to discuss the issues concerning sampling, data handling, and processing protocols. Separate and apart from the committee, um, we've got certain EM, uh, uh, EFP sponsors and proponents will work to resolve any outstanding video review issues for 2022 and 2023. And then we also understood that um, the NIMPS uh, Info Law Procedural Directive um, that has um, some direct linkages to some of the ongoing concerns for our EM program uh, may be discussed at the upcoming CCC meeting. Uh, so we may uh, request our council representatives uh, to take our concerns uh, to that forum. So those two subcommittees are gonna be working on those topic areas. Um, we gave them a re relatively short time to, to do that and uh, such that we can meet again in, in May uh, to hear the outcomes of their work and uh, assign additional next steps as, uh, as needed. 
Uh, we recommend that if an amendment to the EM rule is needed, that the council consider having this as a scoping issue on their June agenda. Uh, that would be followed by selecting a preliminary preferred alternative at the September meeting with the selection of a final preferred alternative no later than March 2023 to ensure implementation on uh, in 2024. And I think I have referenced 2023 as an implementation date deadline, and it should have been 2024. Um, there's also a list there of our current uh, GEMPAC and GEMTAC uh, members. As I said, both of both of our meetings uh, were joint meetings, so we had the entire the uh, group of folks there uh, participating in our meetings. And uh, from at least from my my uh, ch chair uh, perspective, I really appreciated the the kind of can do attitude and problem solving um, attitude that everybody had. Uh, in coming forward, we didn't necessarily get the answers we were hoping for from NIMS on some of those policy issues, but we are uh, not letting that deter us in terms of finding a path forward so that we can be ready to have um, a good EM program um, in place in time for the January 2024 uh, target date. Um, I know uh, in particular, uh, Mr. Dooley was uh, as a part of our committee, uh, welcome. And, and of course, so was uh, Ryan. Um, so if they have anything to add to my report from the committee, happy, happy to have that assistance. Otherwise, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. Let's see if there's anything to be added to the report and then we can have questions on the report. Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and thank you, Phil, for uh, such a, a great report. It's uh, complete. I have, I have nothing to add. I just <clears throat> would add that your analysis of a can-do spirit in that committee is refreshing, and I think we're exploring all all options. So, uh, and really, particularly um, appreciate your leadership, Phil and Ryan appreciate your uh, increased interest and, and participation and leadership with, as well. So thank you. All right, so are there any questions on the report that we've heard? All right, thank you very much. Oh, Corey. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Gaze there for a second. Yeah, thank you for the report and really, really good to hear about the problem solving attitude. Phil, maybe um, just a quick question on, on the increased cost to Pacific states. I uh, had a chance to, to ask you before, but didn't. But is it is the cost going up because the review amount of review is going up or is it, it, it do you know, or is it more of a um, costs are just higher for the same level of hours being reviewed? <laughs> Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Niles, um, I mean, I can give you um, my um, what I kind of what I heard from from Mr. Copel. They're they're probably um, obviously in a much better position to answer that question, but they have had some staffing issues. Um, I don't know exactly what they all were, but I think they've had to um, add some staff. Uh, uh, due to some of those issues, which is increased costs. Uh, they've fallen uh, behind a bit in the, in the review. Uh, and so I think they had to bring some additional staff on to try to catch up. Um, but that's about all the detail that, that I have in terms of the, the, uh, uh, the reasons behind the increase in, in their costs. All right, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Grolnick. Um Phil, on the three-week turnaround, is that uh, requirement, is that consistent to what is uh, required in the observer program? Or is that, I'm kind of curious, is there a higher standard for that turnaround on the information um, than the, 
than the observer program is, or it seems to me that a little more time would help the economy of scale with uh, with the city state. So I don't know if maybe you or or Ryan may answer that, but well, um, my understanding of that is what it's it's based on the current EM program manual that that is referenced in our report. But it is uh, an, a topic area that our subcommittee uh, that I mentioned that's working on these issues will be addressing and talking about and talking with um, National Marine Fishery Service. And, and uh, uh, there may be some recommendations that come out of that to, that would uh, recommend a change in that that would help make the, the program more cost effective. Uh, but so all of those types of things are are fair game for discussion uh, by our subgroup and bringing back to the full committee. Ryan. Yeah, thank you. And just you know, to add on to that, that three weeks um, was a council recommendation when we put that in the cleanup rule. So that has been before the council and that was your recommendation and related to your question, Brad, the observer program actually turns it around in seven days. All right, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a, a question for Ryan on the last comment there. I realize that the observer program does turn it around in seven days, but by the time they do the, my understanding is by the time they do their uh, debriefing, which happens maybe months after, in some cases, there could be adjustments. And that's kind of what we're looking at here, I believe. Am I correct on that? Ryan. Yeah, I mean, in general, it's actually entered in within three days, almost often. But what you're talking about, Bob, but 95% of the data is final within two weeks. All right, any further questions on the Jim Pack report? All right, we'll now hear from the gap, Brent Payne. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Chairman Gorlick, uh, Brent Payne with you know, the United Catch Boats uh, Gap member. Can I, can you hear me okay? You bet. Great. Yeah, I didn't update the, the app on my computer, so I'm using my cell phone, but it's working great. Well, good Good morning. Uh, I'm going to give the uh, Groundfish Advisory Subpanels report on, on EM, uh, Supplemental Gap Report number one. Uh, the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel received reports from Mr. Brett Weedoff, Mr. Ryan Wolf and uh, myself representing the, the GEMPAC as a GEMPAC member regarding updates on electronic monitoring issues and potential solutions related to draft implementing regulations. The, the GAP reviewed NIPS report number one that Ryan Wolf just gave to you, and then as well as the, uh, the joint uh, or the GEMPAC report that uh, Phil Anderson just gave to you as well under this agenda item. The, uh, the GAP very much appreciates the GEMPAC, GEMTAC's work to date. Uh, I'd also add that we should have put in there the work that uh, the agency uh, sustainable fisheries folks have done and, and also Mr. Phil Anderson has, has uh, taken the lead on um, this redo project. Uh, and it sees this work as beneficial process to find solutions to problems that were identified during the original amendment and rulemaking. Uh, we acknowledge there's no council action associated with this agenda item at this meeting. Uh, however, with uh, the EM program implementation date of January 1st, 2024, the GAP urges the Council and the GEMTAC to stay on task in developing recommendations that will achieve the stated goals for undergoing a redo of the current NIMPS recommended EM regulations. The GAP continues to be concerned about EM being too cumbersome and too expensive for all users, uh, especially for the bottom trawl and fixed gear sectors. One of the original intentions of doing an exempted fishing permit for EM for bottom trawl vessels was to find a less expensive alternative and also to provide flexibility to fishermen to, to ensure 100% monitoring versus paying for observers and the, the high cost of observers in a rationalized fishery. The, the trawl catch share program has not returned the monetary benefits of the program as, as originally expected. So in short, under the current EM program design, it may be less expensive for bottom trawl vessels to use human observers, thereby negating the EM EFP and the work that has been done to date to make EM work for trawl vessels. Um, the GAP urges the council and NIMS to continue to work towards finding efficiencies in the EM program 
that would make it more a more cost effective. Um, additionally, the gap notes EM may become a useful tool that can be used on smaller vessels should the need arise, but it would critically be critically important to keep costs on par or lower than human observers for fishermen participating in those fisheries. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes the gap statement on this uh, agenda item. Happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions on the gap <laughs> statement? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Brett, for the great report. Um, I guess my question centers around um, the third to last paragraph where there's a comment about it may be um, expensive for bottom trawlers to, to participate in this program. And over the course of me, my being on the council, I've heard a lot of conversation about we need everybody in the program to make it successful. So just wondering if um, that makes it possible for the Whiting fleet that's worked incredibly hard on their EFPs, put a lot of time and thought and energy into this program working, um, you know, what that would mean for them um, and really what what this would mean for everybody. Um, was there conversation in the gap on that or can you provide additional clarification for me? Uh, yes, to the chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Swinson. Um, the, the Some of the bottom trawl representatives on the gap did uh, make some statements to, to that regard. Um, the the uh, uh, from a whiting perspective, it's the EM tool is a little bit easier to you know because all you're looking for is if uh, uh, you know you have a single species pretty much and a very very small incidental amount of of of, of other fish that come up with the whiting hulls. So it's uh, and it's a real quick review by Pacific States too for doing whiting um, review data. Uh, bottom trawl is a little bit more difficult because you have uh, multiple species that come up and um, it's a bit more complex uh, for the the EM program so uh, uh, I think that, that uh, I'm not sure if that gets to your total question about uh, everybody needing to be in um, but I think uh, um, at the, from the from the gap, I, I don't know if there was any any more detailed discussion about this issue at this time. Did that answer your question, Kristen? Oh, well, it, it I mean it answered half the question, but the question about can the whiting fleet proceed without everybody? Um, not quite. Oh. I see. Yeah, Mr. Wolf had his hand up, so maybe not. Uh, uh, and maybe uh, maybe somebody can talk to me offline about that as well. But just just wanting to sure. make sure that people that have been working hard um, can find a path forward if if some of us um, cannot afford to participate in EM. Uh, through, through the chair, yes, that, that very simple. I, I, now I understand the, the, that second part of your question. Um, yes, that the, the, we we could have just a whiting EM program if that would be the case. But I think. The intent of all trawl sectors is to see if we can have a complete EM program for, for, you know, not just the whiting fishery, but the the bottom trawl and the fixed gear um, portions that are under a rationalized fishery. So, yeah. All right. Any further questions? Qu go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Sorry for put my hand up a little prematurely. I wanted to ask a separate question, oh, Brent. And thanks for your presentation, Brent. Brent, did the, did the GAP discuss whether they would support a third party model with Pacific states competing? Um, so you can assess best value. Is that anything the GAP discussed? Uh, through the chair, um, Mr. Wolf, uh, I don't believe the GAP specifically discussed that question. I, I can. I don't know how far I can sway from being a GAP member versus trying to give you the report from the GAP here, but but I would say the industry definitely is is asking that question right now. All right. Anything else? Uh, any other questions of the GAP report? All right. Thanks very much, Brent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, that concludes the reports I have. I don't believe there's any public comment. So that will take us to 
council action on the screen there to provide guidance. And uh, so let's let's have some discussion and some guidance. Bob Dooley. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, <clears throat> I hear, you know, I hear loud and clear there's questions, but there's also those same questions in the, in the committee to my, from my perspective, and we're working on those. We just, we just got the, actually the report that we couldn't use cost recovery. I think it was the day before our last meeting. So there are a lot of questions that I think the committee's working diligently. I think at the next check-in, we'll have a, a lot more answers, but I always go back to my, probably my original comment to OEM is we need to keep an eye on not designing a Cadillac when all we need is a Chevy. And, and we need to do this cost effectively to be successful. And I think that's the goal, the, the overarching goal of the committee. So thank you. Thank you, Bob, Phil. Um, you know, obviously this is a work in progress. Uh, we need to transition away from an EFP and, and get this program implemented under regulation. My guess is that when we do that, it won't be perfect. And that uh, there will be, but that doesn't mean there will not be opportunities to fix the imperfections that exist when we do get it implemented under regulations in January of 2024. So, um, <laughs> We're going to, we need, in my view, we need to do the best that we can to get the principal components of the program in place so that it can be up and operational. And, but at the same, at the same time, recognize that it's not going to be perfect. And if, and where there are areas that need continued work with potential changes as a result in the regulations that are ultimately adopted, that we continue to do that work so that uh, at the end, at, at, uh, at some point in time, uh, that it is a program that, that is available to everyone. And that is, um, and that would, they would view as a co more cost effective approach than carrying human observers. But, um, it's not going to go from where it is now to perfection on January, 2024. So I think we have to set our, you know, make sure, you know, we have to have realistic expectations. That's just my view. Thank you. Corey. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And uh, yeah, just I'll quickly say um, that the overall message must here is that, uh, yeah, definitely support the work of the committee. Thanks to all the members and to NIMS for, for working on it. And, and thanks for the excellent report, Phil. Um, I'll just put some thoughts out there that are bouncing around in my mind and maybe some, some questions. Um, but, but I guess one, and just this is not to be critical, but just to um, maybe rephrase or state the way I see the uh, the purpose um, of EM, maybe slightly different than is in the gem pack. And it's, I think the purpose is to maintain the individual accountability of the IFQ program um, and and try to do it more cost effectively. And, and with EM, that comes with uh, the logbook uh, estimate of discards, and it seems to be working. And that's that's the goal. Let's let's maintain individual accountability, which is a different thing than trying to estimate discards for a sector as a whole. And and I'm impressed by by that everyone is is on that same page, and uh, you know uh, really impressed with with how it's done. So that's that's the purpose: individual accountability. EM it comes with less with less flexibility on what you can discard. Um, and, and that does seem to be working. And I guess just the questions I have, I think that one of the fundamental uh, choices that the council has been considering is what is gonna be a more cost effective, a third party uh, model or a government program. And uh, we use this term sole source contracting <coughs> as if it's, if it's, it's unusual, um, but that's, that's how PACFIN's funded, that's how RECFIN's funded. It's, it's a program that we ask Pacific States to administer and it's a little discouraging to, but not surprising to see costs go up for pacific states um and what, what that happens with pacfin for example what happens is you know pacfin has been flat funded for 
I don't know, 17, 18 years is, is about right. Um, what happens is, you know, if funding's flat, costs go up, services go down. Uh, and so, yeah, what is going to be better here? A third party where, you know, that involves competition. And I can see why people would be nervous about competing when, when costs go up and you hire staff and you don't get the business. And, you know, it's, it's a different world in, in, in the private market. And as, as people in the industry, you know, um, but I guess the, the why Pacific States is more cost effective, um, and this my memory and, and understanding is could be off is because uh, it would save money on other like the auditing function. And so a, a question I have in mind is Ryan told us of, you know, if we're if we're going to want to use a sole source um, authority, which again I would I would phrase as creating a program at Pacific States for electric monitoring to be funded by NIMPS. And, and maybe some another fundamental question is how do we split the cost between the private sector and, and the public, the government supported? Um, that would require an appropriation, and you know that's out of NIMS's hands and in, in, in the hands of Congress. But I'm not still understanding. And the question for later is is you know creating a third party model does require creating a government program at the science center to do the audit function and how confident are you in getting the appropriation for that? So again, these are just these questions bouncing around in my mind. I uh, really commend all the, the again, the, the, the can do problem solving attitude and the plan that, that Mr. Anderson put forward to keep working on it. it makes a lot of sense and uh, thanks everyone for working on that. Thank you, Corey. Well, I'm not seeing any other hands. I know that the the, the report, pardon, Maggie, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for being slow. I was just uh, noting on at the end of the GEMPAC report, there is a comment that if an amendment to the EM rule is needed, there should be a scoping item on this June's agenda item. And I am un, unclear on uh, the thinking about whether an amendment is needed or not. If that was um, reflected in the GEMPAC report, my apologies for missing it. Bill? Um, my, um, my response is that I, we don't know yet until we have our third meeting in May whether or not we might be thinking that a um, an amendment to the regulation is needed, um, but we, it, you know, being mindful of the time frame in which we have to work, we thought that it that it uh, that it would be wise to have that as a placeholder during our workload discussion for the in our planning for the June agenda, and if it, um, and I don't, well. I'm going to say I don't think it would be a, a long agenda item, but uh, to have a placeholder on the June agenda. And then if if coming out of our May meeting, we don't think that that will be necessary, that we could, obviously we have Mr. Weedoff as our staff officer that's supporting our group and could make the appropriate adjustments to the June agenda based on that, the outcome of that discussion. All right, thank you. Okay, anything else from the council on this agenda item? And then I'll go back to Brett Weedoff and see if we've covered our bases here. Brett? Uh, thank you, Chair Gronick. I think you've uh, discussed the reports and the information at hand. Um, obviously, we're going to have another meeting coming up soon with the gem pack intact or some subgroups meeting and and try to feed that information and uh along to the council um we'll have to think about uh on during workload planning whether we should schedule something for june it sounds like we we may want to do that um it is a little bit of a timing issue uh if we do schedule something now that uh that meeting federal register notice is going to come out probably likely before our meeting in May uh, with the GEMPAC tech, but I'll work with 
uh, Mr. Burner and Mr. Merrick about, uh, or Mr. <laughs> Merrick Burden about uh, this idea and where we're going. So, uh, but I think that just concludes our agenda item here for F7. Well, Phil, yeah, thanks. Well, I, I think at the very least we will have an update for you. The committee will have an update for you in June that we would like a little bit of time to provide. So, it, okay, it does not includes scope scoping of a potential amendment or not. We'd still like to have an opportunity to report back. No, okay. Thank you. That's clear. I appreciate that, Mr. Anderson. All right. So that concludes agenda item F7. And we'll move right into agenda item F8, end season adjustments, final action. And Todd, would you please give us an overview? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Council. Uh, so as the Chair indicated, this is F8, end season adjustments. Uh, so as the Council aware, this is the opportunity for uh, you to make adjustments to any management measures for ground fish. Um, that are necessary to attain but not exceed annual catch limits and of course these adjustments could include a myriad of things but in general um, things like catch limit adjustments season structures um, are um, something you can consider as part of this action um, looking at your briefing book materials you have three supplemental reports one from the national marine fisheries service uh, one from California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and one from the GMT. Your action, as usual, is to consider projections for the 2022 fisheries and adopt any 2022 in-season adjustments as necessary. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you or the council may have, uh, but or we could move directly into the reports as you see fit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Are there any questions on the overview? All right, um, there is a NIMS report. I don't know if NIMS intends to speak to it, but go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I can be brief. This is our um, report updating the council on the 2022 trawl gear EFP. Um, as of March 15, 12 vessels have participated. They've caught 30 Chinook, no Yukon, Surgeon, or Coho, uh, and approximately 4.5 million pounds of ground fish, totaling um, approximately 1.3 million in, re in revenue. Then the rest is there in the table. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Any questions on the NIMS report? Okay. We will go next to the report of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Melanie Parker, welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Council members. Again, I'm Melanie Parker with CDFW, and today I will be walking you through our supplemental CDFW report one. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this informational report that CDFW provides several times per year um, just on an update of recreational and commercial catch in our non-trawl fisheries in California. Uh, we did want to point out some key additions and improvements to our report for 2022. Um, we have several tables and a couple of figures in this report that I will walk you through. In table one, this is our combined total. So this is our recreational catch mortality that is based off of our uh, monthly surf estimates and then commercial landings, um, which do not include the um, discard mortality estimates. Um, we also include what our tracking limit is, the reference point and our percent attainment. Um, so this year we did add some additional species to this list, including split nose rockfish, spiny dogfish, um, the flatfishes. We've also included sablefish and the thorny heads. And one other key difference here is that while we've always reported um, the near shore rockfish complex totals north and south of 4010, um, this year we have also broken out copper and quillback rockfish. Um, those total values for copper and coolback are included in the complex totals, um, but we did want to provide the species specific numbers um, as we are tracking them more closely this year and we made some significant changes through in season adjustments at the end of last year that became effective January 1. Um, in table one for the nearshore rockfish between 42 and 4010, 
the copper and quillback tracking um, reference points are the contribution to the California Near Shore Rockfish Harvest Guideline. Um, these are reference points. Um, they're not hard tracking limits. And additionally, for near shore rockfish south of 4010, um, the copper and quillback numbers that we've provided are the ACL contributions to the complex. Um, I also want to point out we had a little bit of a data gremlin in this table, and the copper rockfish south of 4010 um, attainment level is not 16.7% of the total right now. It is 0.3%. Um, something weird happened there. Uh, so I just want to let you know it is 0.3, not 16.7. Uh, additionally, with sablefish south, the total commercial landings are uh, 49.8 metric tons, which is approximately 2.8% of the um, total. Uh, table two is just focused on our recreational monthly catch estimates. And as of the time that we um, drafted this report, only catch estimates through January were available. Um, there is a five to eight week lag between when data is collected and when estimates become available. Um, so as we move through the year, the estimates for each month will be filled in as they become available. Um, and as we move through the year, the um, fisheries do start to open. Um, in March, our southern management area opened. April, our San Francisco and central management areas open. And then May 1, um, the northern parts of the state, uh, the northern and Mendocino management areas open. So we do expect to see catches of our uh, target species increasing as we go through the year. Um, as I said, since our catch estimates uh, there is a five to eight week lag between when the data is collected and the estimates become available. CDFW has developed a, a proxy um, process um, to, to help us gauge where we are um, in terms of catch um, during that lag time. Um, we call this process, it's our anticipated catch value or ACVs. Uh, this is a process that we have been using since 2008. Um, it's been very useful for um, recreational catch of yellow eye rockfish and cow cod. We also use the same process for our Pacific halibut catch. Uh, the process relies on the relationship between the number of sampled fish and the monthly catch estimates from prior years. And then we take the current year reported sampled fish, the number of sampled fish, um, and multiply it by a coefficient that was generated um, from that past relationship of sampled to estimated fish. So this year we have added quillback rockfish and copper rockfish to the list of species for which we um, perform these ACVs. So that is something new and additional that CDFW is doing for our in-season tracking. Um, these ACVs are generated weekly internally um, so table three and table four are our ACVs for quillback and copper rockfish through March 27th. Um, we've split them out north and south of 4010. You can see in table three, we don't have any data for quillback rockfish yet. The boat-based fisheries where quillback rockfish are most commonly found um, have not really opened yet. So we expect to see some data start trickling in uh, as we move through the year. I will let you know in table four, which is our copper rockfish um, ACVs, south of 4010, we do have some data um, for January and February, um, and then also March. Um, in the months when the estimates are available, we will strike out the ACV value, and that ACV value will no longer be included in generating the total of our uh, best estimate of catch. Um, so through March 27th, um, south of 4010, our best data using the ACVs was 2.4 metric tons. Um, that total does include a formal monthly catch estimate of January um, of 0 0.1 metric tons, and then our ACVs for February and March, which is about 2.3 metric tons. Um, so in a couple of days, when our February catch estimates become available, that 0 0.1 metric ton total for February will be replaced in the, um, in the calculation by the monthly catch estimate.
And this is a process that we will um, continue throughout the year. Um, again, it's been really useful for our other species that we track really closely. Table five uh, provides our uh, commercial landings. Um, we do have data through the end of March here. Um, it is the same list of species and complexes that was in table one. Um, again, uh, it's expanded from prior years. Um, north of 4010, our copper and quillback totals are about zero. And south of 4010, copper and quillback, we have had a little bit of catch, um, 0.2 metric tons of copper uh, each month of the three months. And then for quillback rockfish, we've had about 0.2 metric tons um, total take. And then uh, for sablefish south of 36, again, we have a little bit of a correction. Um, data gremlin got in there. The total for sablefish south should be 49.8 metric tons. And then another way to view our take of copper and quillback rockfish and uh, a great way to visualize how these new sub trip limits that became effective January 1 this year, which are 75 pounds two, per two months each for copper and quillback rockfish, both north and south of 4010. We've provided figure one and figure two on pages 10 and 11. Uh, figure one is uh, copper rockfish. The top figure is between 42 and 4010. The bottom figure is uh, south of 4010. The uh, y-axis is metric tons, and then the blue line is the cumulative landings in 2021. So this was last year's cat or landings um, throughout the year without that sub-trip limit. The gray line that goes across horizontally, that was our 2022 landings projection with these new sub-trip limits in place. And then the orange line is the cumulative landings in 2022. So you can see copper rockfish north of 4010, significant reduction already compared to 2021. And then copper rockfish south of 4010, uh, we hit a little bit of data gremlin again. Um, the orange line should be just slightly higher than it is um, shown in March right here, but again, significantly lower than the blue line, significantly lower landings in 2022 compared to 2021. Quillback rockfish, um, again, we have on uh, figure two, we have a figure that is north of 4010 and another one that is south of 4010. Um, to date for commercial landings, we've had uh, 0.2 metric tons, which is 468 pounds of quillback rockfish, um, not a lot. And again, it's significantly reduced compared to 2021 when those sub-trip limits were not in place. Um, so we expect to continue to provide um, additional reports through the year in June, September, and November um, that will um, update these cumulative totals throughout the year. Um, and with that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much, Melanie. Are there any questions on the CDFW report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, not a question, but a comment um, on the 468 pounds of quillback rockfish that have been landed statewide that Melanie just reported. Um, I asked a few questions this morning about that number um, because there was some discussion about uh, the trip limits that we had established back in November. And 18 vessels uh, were responsible for that catch of the 465, uh, 468 pounds. Um, what that suggests to me is that the trip limits are um, effectively working as we intended, which is to encourage avoidance of quillback rockfish, but occasionally you're, you might catch one. And when you do, go ahead and land it. So, um, that's not a whole lot of catch uh, in the bag for 18 vessels that are operating in the near shore and targeting near shore rockfish. So um, just happy to report that early success that our management uh, is working as intended. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on the CDFW report? All right, thank you very much, Melanie. 
We'll now hear from the ground fish management team, Mel Mandrip. Welcome, Mel. Good morning, Council. Uh, Mel Mandrup here with the uh, ground fish management team. I will be reading from agenda item F8A, Supplemental Re GMT Report 1, on in-season actions, adjustments, final action. Um, as always, the GMT discuss the status of our ground fish fisheries, uh, any requests from industry, and um, provide it to you in this report. Uh, at this point, uh, thankfully, no action items. Um, so I'll just uh, go forward with just the informational bits of our report. Uh, Sablefish limited entry uh, and open access trip limits. The GMT did not receive any requests to increase any of the sable fish trip limits in the limited entry and open access sec sectors, but the council has recently expressed interest in exploring whether it is possible to increase them prior to the September council meeting in order to allow more vessels to take advantage of the higher trip limits. The GMT ran the sable fish trip limit models prior to the April 2022 council meeting and discovered that the model for the limited entry fixed gear so sector north of 36 is severely underestimating sable fish catches in recent months. This is because the model assumes a linear relationship between sable fish prices and vessel participation. And in years where the price per pound of sable fish is below $3 per pound, the model projects extremely low participation. However, generally a minimum of 10 vessels participate regardless of price the be and below $3 a pound. The sable fish price appears to have less influence on the number of vessels in the fishery. For reference, sable fish prices in the limited entry north sector have generally, generally ranged from $1, $6 per pound, which is adjusted for inflation. Uh, for the majority of landings since 2020, 2012, with some reaching up to $10 per pound. Since 2020, average limited entry north prices by period have been tracking lower than $2.50 per pound. Under a low price scenario, the model predicts that six vessels will participate between May and August of 2022. But in 2021, a total of 14 vessels participated during that time, despite the similar, uh, similarly low sable fish prices. Using the average price scenario, predictions as a proxy does not appear to resolve the issue, which is associated with a, the linear regression between the price and the participation. The GMT plans to explore further refinements to the model after June Council, uh, meaning to attempt to better capture the true relationship between stable fish price and participation. Discussions with the gap in indicated that the high price, high participation in 2022 so far, despite low prices, is likely due to closures or low allocations in other fisheries, such as Dungeness crab and salmon, thus incentivizing prioritization of the sable fish limited entry and open access fisheries. The gap also noted for these reasons, along with ex expected increases in sable fish prices, participation in 2022 is likely going to be even higher than in recent years. Therefore, the GMT did not feel that increasing sable fish trip limits was appropriate at this time, given the limited entry uh, north model in, in a bit the model's inability to accurately predict participation and catches under the current market conditions. The limited entry north sector is the highest sable fish attaining sector in the four trip limit sectors and therefore the sector for which the council generally takes uh, added precaution. Additionally, the council generally prefers to keep open access trip limits lower than limited entry, so the GMT did not consider increasing the open access north trip limits. Market and infrastructure continue to limit attainment in the south, so the GMT did not see the need to increase those trip limits either. 
the GMT will run the model prior to the June 2022 council meeting and consider whether precautionary trip limit increases can be implemented at that time. Recognizing the participation is likely to be high and the model may continue to underestimate catch. So moving um, through the report, uh, we have our standard Chinook salmon scorecard. Um, there's been only, uh, well, an estimated 783 uh, Chinook taken so far in the season. Um, that includes the preseason estimate uh, for, um, sorry, that would be for non-whiting. Uh, that includes the preseason estimate that uh, of 500 for the fixed gear and rec fleet. Uh, and then for whiting, uh, that that 560 is just the, that preseason tribal uh, estimate. And um, moving through short belly, uh, we're about 8.2 metric tons compared to that 2,000 threshold. Uh, just noting that um, we are still early in the year, so not much activity, and um, that's that's leading to these lower numbers for both Chinook and Short Belly. And to uh, wrap up the report, we have the standard yellow eye rockfish uh, projections. Um, there's been some slight uh, adjustments, but we're still um, where pretty much where we were <laughs> with our projections from March. Uh, and with that, I conclude this, uh, the GMT report <laughs> uh, and happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Mel. Are there questions of the GMT? All right, thank you very much, Mel. All right, that uh, completes all of our reports. Uh, the last I looked, there was not any public comment and there is still no public comment. So that concludes public comment. <laughs> and will take us to our council action, which is to consider the projections and to adopt any in-season adjustments as necessary. So I will look around the table for someone to get us started. Corey Niles. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. You're just just um, just to thank you to the GMT for following up on the request to look at the, the sable fish trip limits um, and, and putting those in. And if, if we're tracking behind, as we have in the past couple of years, then to try to catch up sooner than later. I think Mr. Burden, others around the uh, around this table might you know remember that the council's policy is to spread the increases out across the year as much as possible, given you know differences on the coast and, and weather and if we bump them up later in the year, then uh, areas in the north don't have as much opportunity as 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 areas to the south, um, where the weather is maybe nicer in December than it is at certain times of the year. So that's the general um, general aim we've uh, we've long had, and appreciate the challenges that GMT is having with the model. And and uh, again, thank them thank them for looking continuing to look into that and recognizing the trip limits were increased quite a bit for this year. So um, we'll, we'll see more in June. And again, thank you. All right. Bob Dooley followed by Pete Hassemer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thanks, Mel, for the uh, GMT report as well. I um, noticed the, the modeling of trying to estimate um, effort is, you know, and being tied to price is, is, um, is, is challenging at best, but there's so many other, as we're seeing, uh, factors that need to be considered such as, you know, lower effort, lower opportunity and other, other fisheries that drive people who may be fish at sm lower prices than would be normal because they have to they have to have income and so and then the other thing i'm thinking about is uh, there might be something to consider is the fuel prices that we're going to be experiencing are experiencing now and how they may affect that 
So that, com that, that really complicates that model and the variables interact with each other at varying degrees. So just wanted to kind of point that out that I'm, you guys are doing a great job, but that's a, that's a tall task to get that model to try to predict in all cases because we, they, they interact so much, you know, fuel prices, uh, marketability. I mean, your international marketability of Sable might be affected with all of the world events that are going on. So hard to, hard to really put a, to peg it just on price. So I appreciate your, uh, pointing all that out to us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. Pete Hassemer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this one is easy. I, I too want to express, express my thanks to the GMT for the report. And I noticed at the bottom of page two and on the page three regarding short belly, that information is now publicly available. So the, the GMT requested guidance from us about continuing to put that table in this report. Um, I just thought back to actions the council took last November and our discussions under agenda item F4 a couple of days ago that'll continue. And anyway, all when I think about all of that, my crystal ball says this is valuable information. It's worth the time of the GMT to put to, that together. So I'd like to see it in there. Thanks. Very thank you, Pete. Any uh, any further discussion on this agenda item? I'm not hearing any adjustments. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, want to uh, encourage council members uh, at any point in time, if you have suggestions to CDFW for um, additional in-season tracking needs or if there are items that you'd like to see in future reports, um, we'll be happy to do our best. Uh, just want to again flag that um, we did make some significant changes to our report uh, this, uh, this year uh, based on a need to um, very carefully track copper and quillback rockfish uh, on both the commercial and uh, recreational fleets. So um, if there's other information we can bring to you in our regular in-season uh, reports for the remainder of the year and beyond, we're happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. All right, any, any further council guidance or action on this agenda item? Okay, Todd, how are we doing? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the council has been briefed about in-season actions or the, the, the no need for in-season action at this particular juncture. Um, you've had a good discussion and I believe that you have completed this agenda item satisfactory and that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you, Todd. Well, owing, I guess, to the hard work done behind the scenes, we're running quite early today. So we're going to take a break here and then uh, put our heads together and see what we can, what, what changes we might make uh, to, to move things up. We will have um, the Rear Admiral from the Coast Guard here to provide a presentation. We're expecting that around 1030. So let's just take a 15 minute break here and then we'll come back at uh, 935.
We're going to break until 1030, at which time we'll take up uh, Coast Guard.
Okay, we'll get started in just a few minutes here. I promise. Are we ready to start right <laughs> My good. I heard you're a little uh, early, so I. All right, well, not at all. So we'll get started here, and we'd like to welcome uh, Rear Admiral Bubalis here uh, for this agenda item. And um, I think first we'll turn to Dr. Seeger for an overview, and then we'll turn it over to the Coast Guard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, you have the current commander of the uh, U.S. Coast Guard 13th District, uh, Admiral Bubalis, with you this morning. Uh, this is your annual U.S. Coast Guard report. Uh, there's not. This is an informational action, so there's no uh, um, informational item. Excuse me. So there's no action uh, specifically re required of you under this agenda item. All right. Didn't mean to catch you by surprise there, Jim. So now I'd like to turn to uh, Rear Admiral Bubalis. Welcome to our April Council meeting. It's always great to have the Coast Guard here, a great partner of the Council. And I understand after you address us, we'll have a presentation that'll be led by Lieutenant Commander Brett Ettinger. So welcome. Great. Well, thank you, sir. I'm just... Uh, I'm taking this in. This is my first one. So I'm looking around at quite a uh, facility that you have, and uh, I'm certainly pleased to do this. So I've got some prepared remarks, then we'll turn it over to Brett. So good morning, members of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. As I mentioned, uh, or as was mentioned, I'm Rear Admiral Mel Bobulis, the commander of the Coast Guard's uh, District 13, which encompasses the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. And it's my honor to represent both District 13 and District 11, which uh, together encompasses the entire Pacific Coast, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And it's neat to be here in Seattle and in person. I don't know about you all, but I'm 
I'm excited about kind of getting back to normal and seeing faces and, uh, and building some relationships. So <clears throat> it's great to be here again. And um, it's a privilege for me to speak to this impressive group. Uh, I can't express really how important your role is in managing commercial, recreational, and uh, tribal fish fisheries for about 119 species of salmon, ground fish, uh, coastal pelagic and highly migratory species in federal waters. And um, I know we've got some folks calling in and all as well, but I really encourage you to, to uh, take this opportunity in the conference to network and continue to seek opportunities so that we can coordinate between agencies, uh, really in an effort to provide some stewardship of these critical resources. So I'd also like to extend and a uh, warm welcome to the city and all to all of our distinguished guests, Pacific Fishery Management Council leadership, including uh, Mark Gordon, thank you, and Executive Director Mark Burden, our other council members, NOAA, states, and tribes. And thank you as well to the fellow members of the enforcement consults and staff uh, officer, Dr. Jim Seeger, uh, for your continued support and assistance. And I'm honored to be here today and, and proud to take this opportunity to provide just a few comments as well as highlight the work that the Coast Guard's done in support of the Council uh, Managed Fisheries here on the West Coast. I'll also uh, offer some brief remarks and then turn the chair over to Brett Edinger uh, for the Coast Guard's formal report. So the Coast Guard's highest priority in the fisheries realm is really the protection of the U.S. Uh, exclusive economic zone, protecting them from foreign fishery incursions. And to that end, the Coast Guard's been busy. Uh, we monitored uh, with the U.S. and Canada and U.S.-Mexican, Mexico maritime boundary lines, and also with the U.S.-Canada Treaty Albacore Fishery, we embarked NOAA OLE enforcement officers and Canadian Department of Fisheries and Ocean Conservation officers aboard Coast Guard Cutter Steadfast, home ported in Astoria, Oregon. And they were on there for the final patrol of their month. Uh, fortunately, no significant violations were detected during that, uh, that tour or that cruise. Domestically, the Coast Guard dedicated nearly 11,500 surface hours and over 1,500 aircraft hours for fisheries enforcement. And we conducted over 2,500 fisheries boardings with approximately 25% of those on commercial vessels and the remainder being on recreational vessels, charter and tribal vessels. And we detected 65 fisheries violations, 168 commercial safety violations and 298 recreational safety violations. And on the search and rescue side, which we're uh, uh, popular for, we saw an increase in uh, really no lives lost in 2007, or excuse me, 2020, to seven lives lost in 2021. That's seven lives, that's seven, seven individuals and all those impacted. This really provides a stark reminder to how dangerous um, the fishing, uh, fishing occupation really is. And we value the hard work that, uh, that you all do in association with the profession out on those dangerous waters. <clears throat> And we urge you to continue to be safe while doing it. Uh, I encourage you to use the Coast Guard resources that are available, dockside exams, classes that we provide to really learn how to uh, properly and effectively use safety gear, run safety drills, and maximize uh, the operator's safety uh, on those potentially treacherous oceans. With respect to illegal, unreported and unregulated fisheries, the Coast Guard conducted the 25th iteration of Operation North Pacific Guard with Coast Guard Cutter Bertoff, one of our NSCs, National Security Cutters, patrolling 51 days and covering 27,000 nautical miles and boarding 27 foreign flagged vessels, finding potentially 42 violations. And while supporting our Marine Protected Resources mission, the Coast Guard conducted multiple operations focused on protecting Southern resident killer whales, um, ESA listed salmon, short-tailed albatross, 
endangered or threatened large whales, uh, enforcing national marine sanctuaries in the state marine reserves. So as you can see, your Coast Guard is hard at work enforcing and protecting the nation's $5.6 billion value of commercial fisheries. And these efforts don't just end in our waters. We're also engaged in work to uh, ensure that other nations are trained in enforcing their own fish stocks so that the world's fish supplies don't run out for the next generation of fishermen and fisherwomen. But we can't accomplish this mission without your all collective expertise and partnership. And together, we'll continue to work through the challenges of ensuring that we have implemented regulations that uh, both enhance safety and are enforceable uh, at sea and shoreside as well. So I sincerely appreciate how receptive the Council, NOAA, and the states are to input provided by the Coast Guard and our enforcement partners, uh, both through formal liaisons and with the various agencies and advisory bodies, as well as through the formal statements provided by the enforcement consults and the Coast Guard. And before I turn it over to Lieutenant Commander Ettinger Brett, I want to reiterate my thanks to the Pacific Fisheries Management Council for inviting me here today and uh, providing the opening remarks. It's truly an honor to speak with this group. And, um, you know, on behalf of the men and women who serve in this area uh, and your Coast Guard, we're, we're thankful. Thankful for what you do. Thankful for your partnerships and your, your commitment to preserving our critical fish stocks. So thank you all. God bless you. God bless America. Semper Paratus. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And we'll now receive the report from Lieutenant Commander Ettinger. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, Council members, I'm Lieutenant Commander Brett Ettinger, Admiral Bubbles' primary designee on the Council. Additionally, Coast Guard personnel who participate in the Council include uh, Mr. Chris German and uh, Lieutenant Lingo from District, Thir or, sorry, District 11. The Coast Guard appreciates the opportunity to present our annual report today. You'll find our written report under agenda item I-1 of your briefing book. Similar to previous years, our report provides an overview of Coast Guard enforcement efforts from the previous calendar year 2021 in support of PFMC managed fisheries along the U.S. West Coast. As always, we appreciate the Council allotting time to discuss important safety and enforcement issues. The Coast Guard places the safety of the nation's fisheries among its highest priorities. In addition, the Coast Guard recognizes at-sea enforcement as an essential component to the success of our fisheries management plans this Council governs so diligently. The following slides summarize what you'll see in our written report. Uh, next slide, please. Our report contains an overview of the Coast Guard's involvement in the fisheries management process, an update on the Coast Guard resources used to accomplish the Living Marine Resources Protection Mission, and impacts from competing responsibilities in statute missions. A summary of the Coast Guard fisheries enforcement activity over the past year, an engagement with partnering agencies, and finally, a review of fishing vessel safety statistics from 2021. Next slide. The Coast Guard's fishery enforcement mission is guided by our Ocean Guardian strategic plan, and that's a uh, Coast Guard wide. The Ocean Guardian provides a framework for Coast Guard efforts in fisheries enforcement, both on the high seas and within the US EEZ. The Pacific Council's efforts considering and incorporating input from the enforcement consultants is a model to be emulated across the country. Our report today includes highlights of each of the objectives listed here, EEZ enforcement, domestic fisheries, and combating IUU fisheries. On the next slide, um, this chartlet shows the search and rescue and fisheries enforcement resources within the 13th district. The only significant change this year is Coast Guard Cutter Cuddy Hunk, 110 foot patrol boat, home ported in Port Angeles, Washington, will be decommissioned and replaced with Coast Guard Cutter Anacapa from Petersburg, Alaska. And that'll happen in June of this year. We expect to replace Cuddy Hunk and Orcas, our other 110 foot patrol boat, home ported in Coos Bay, Oregon, with 154 foot fast re response boat cutters, home ported in Astoria, Oregon, within the next couple of years. We have no fixed wing aircraft stationed in the 13th district. 
AirStation Sacramento provides fixed wing long range support for Washington, Oregon, and California. On the next slide, uh, down to District 11 in California, uh, District 11 Search and Rescue uh, and Fisheries Enforcement Resources. Coast Guard Cutter Pike is scheduled to change home ports from San Francisco, California to Petersburg, Alaska to support the Cuddy Hunk and a Kappa hull swap. Additionally, Coast Guard Cutter Aspen has relocated to Coast Guard Yard in Baltimore, Maryland for a major refit. Coast Guard Cutter Alder, a 225 foot buoy tender, will relocate to San Francisco to replace the Aspen. Additionally, the Coast Guard has broken grounds on a new air station in Southern California, co-located at Naval Air Station Point Magoo in Oxnard, California. Once complete, several 65, I mean 65 helicopters will relocate from San Francisco to Southern California to fulfill mission responsibilities. Uh, next slide, Coast Guard missions. The Coast Guard has 11 statutory, statutory missions with fisheries enforcement and protection of living marine resources folding into our overall responsibilities. Completing missions and resource limit, competing missions and resource limitations continue to necessi necessitate some difficult decisions to ensure our ability to support the missions most closely related to the council's interests, living marine resource enforcement, including the integrity of the easy vessel safety and search and rescue efforts. Specifically to LMR enforcement, proficiency in that mission is accomplished in part by training provided by the Pacific Regional Fisheries Training Center located in Alameda, California on Coast Guard Island. The training center hosts eight resident courses per year for West Coast boarding officers, uh, four for the Pacific Northwest and four for California. NOAA OLE and state partners provide invaluable support to these trainings. Uh, next slide, domestic resource hours. In 2021, the majority of West Coast off force fisheries enforcement uh, was conducted by 154 foot fast response cutters and 110 and 87 foot patrol boats, which patrolled for 9,200 hours in 2021. Medium endurance cutters and buoy tenders contributed an additional 865 hours. Coast Guard aircraft patrolled for 1,623 hours, while small boat stations patrolled for an additional 1,370 hours. Coast Guard units enforced federal safety regulations and monitored tribal and state fisheries activities in Washington and Turtle Waters, as well as monitoring buoy ten and other coastal recreational salmon fisheries. Domestic boardings, slide eight. Coast Guard units conducted 2,500 commercial and recreational fisheries boardings in Washington, Oregon, and California waters, covering federal, state, and tribal managed species. Approximately 25% of the boardings were on commercial fishing vessels, while the remainder were on recreational and charter vessels. The violations involved documentation of non-compliance with federal fisheries regulations, which were forwarded to NOAA for adjudication, as well as uh, suspected violations of state and tribal regulations that were forwarded to appropriate uh, agencies or tribes for disposition. Some examples of these violations include broadcasting incorrect VMS codes, failure to broadcast AAS out, uh, inside of 12 nautical miles, gear violations, for example, barbed hooks uh, within the salmon fishery, uh, failure to carry HMS logbooks, in, fishing in closed areas, both federal and state uh, marine reserves, fishing during closed periods, and violations of observer regulations. Slide nine, IUUF enforcement. The majority of Coast Guard IUUF operations are out of District 17, which is Alaska, and District 14 in Hawaii. Our report discusses activities directly associated with Coast Guard units from the West Coast, including our involvement in the protection of local EEZ boundary efforts related to the enforcement of the US-Canada Tuna Treaty. On the screen in the upper left, you'll see the location of the 28 boardings conducted by Coast Guard Cutter Bertoff last year. Bertoff is a 418 foot national security cutter home ported in Alameda, California. Moving clockwise in the upper right, you can see the violations per boarding have increased over the past several years um, with 2021 having the highest number in the previous decade. In the lower right, uh, you'll see imagery from a Coast Guard C-130 that was forward deployed to the Aleutian uh, Island chain and then uh, Yokota, Japan, showing WC PFC fishing vessels, uh, finning sharks and releasing carcasses back to the sea uh, this is a violation of the WC PFC conservation and management measures. Um, that imagery from the Coast Guard C-130 resulted in 13 potential violations. Uh, finally on this slide in the lower left, 
is an image uh, from a Canadian Dash 8, that's another fixed wing maritime patrol aircraft, of a vessel finning sharks and discarding carcasses to sea, which is not prohibited under the North Pacific Fisheries Commission um, where this activity occurred, but this imagery is being used to leverage US and Canada delegations recommendations to the MPFC um, to further uh, the prohibition of finning sharks. Slide 10, protected resources. In addition to routine operations, the Coast Guard conducted multiple surge operations focused on protected resources last year. These include Operation Be Whale Wise, which is a coordinated effort uh, amongst state Coast Guard um, and other agencies uh, to protect the southern resident killer whales, in particular, in particular um, vessel approach zones and salmon regulations within the Puget Sounds, Op Buoy 10 and Silver Surf, which uh, was directed for the protection of ESA-listed coho on the Columbia River and in southern Oregon. Op Coleridge, uh, which is the protection of short-tailed albatross through fixed gear toy line uh, regulation enforcement. Op Fluke um, was designed to reduce the interaction with endangered and threatened whales um, by assisting states with the um, relocation and removal of derelict crab gear. And finally, Op Ocean Protector, um, which was enforcing National Marine Sanctuaries regulations both uh, through aircraft and uh, surface patrol. Slide 11, I'm moving into um, commercial fishing vessel safeties uh, regulations. In 2021, uh, we saw an uptick in, in lives lost um, from zero the previous year uh, to seven in 2021. One of the primary Coast Guard objectives during the PFMC process is to identify ways to improve the safety of all fishing activity, whether it's related to commercial or wreck trips whether the fisheries are administered by the federal government, the states, or tribes, and whether activity takes place within the ocean or navigable internal waters. Tragically, this report summarizes incidents on board commercial and recreational, fish, recreational fishing vessels, resulting in the lives, losses of seven lives off the West Coast in 2021. This slide displays the lives lost from commercial fishing vessels um, and compares to other regrettable incidents since 2012. During the previous decade, an average of six lives are lost per year in West Coast commercial fisheries. Slide 12. Uh, commercial fishing vessel, coastal rain. The next few slides highlight some significant Coast Guard search and rescue responses involving vessels participating in West Coast fisheries. The 38-foot coastal, uh, sorry, commercial fishing vessel, coastal rain, had four uh, persons on board and capsized as they were inbound crossing the bar. Coast Guard station Tillamook Bay Tower had visual of one person clinging to the rocks or crab pots, and a good Samaritan reported the second person wearing a life jack climbing on the rocks. The station, uh, Coast Guard Station Tillamook, launched both of their motor lifeboats, 47-foot lifeboats, um, who were on scene and commenced searches to the area. A Coast Guard 47-foot motor lifeboat recovered one person in the water who was responsive, and a second recovered a person uh, who was unresponsive. A helicopter. Um, from Airfac North Bend hosted, hoisted the person from the jetty and a fourth crew member was reported in the center of the channel. The Coast Guard uh, 47 arrived on scene and confirmed the fourth person face down tangled in debris. All four individuals were recovered um, and were taken to awaiting EMS, two responsive and two unresponsive. At the time of the incident, the Tillamook Bay, was restrict Tillamook Bay Bar was restricted to all recreational and uninspected, uninspected passenger vessels. Commercial fishing vessel Coast Marine announced that they were going to cross the bar. However, no Coast Guard assistance was requested prior to the vessel capsizing. Station Tillamook's tower was manned at the time of the capsiz capsizing, and the tower watchstander observed the incident as it occurred. Slide 13, fishing vessel Puffin. In June, a 23-foot fiberglass salmon troller with two people on board ran aground in Drake's Bay, California due to fatigue. There were no injuries. Due to limited access from land and sea, the two persons on board were rescued by Sector San Francisco MH-65 helicopter and hoisted off the beach. The vessel broke up in the surf and was a total loss. Slide 14, fishing vessel Desire. Fishing vessel Desire reported that they were taking on water approximately 20 nautical miles offshore of Umpqua River. The crew reported they were abandoning ship into a life raft. The vessel's emergency uh, indicating radar beacon, their EPIRB, was activated and received by District 13's command center. District 13 was able to contact the owner and confirm that five people were on board the fishing vessel. Coast Guard helicopters arrived on scene and located all in life raft. All five survivors were recovered by a rescue swimmer and safely hoisted. 
No serious injuries were reported. The vessel was last seen with the keel showing above water and is considered a total loss. Slide 15, commercial fishing vessel, Blue Dragon. In November, a 30-foot steel, steel, 30 steel tuna boat, 350 nautical miles west of Monterey, with seven people on board, had a fire in the pilot house. After sending out a mayday, all persons on board abandoned ship into a life raft and rescued by a passing deep draft amber vessel, it's a maritime assist vessel, and disembarked uh, the deep draft the next day in the port of San Francisco. The vessel was eventually salvaged. Slide number 16. Pack PARs. In 2021, the Coast Guard initiated the Port Pacific Coast Port Access Route Study to evaluate safe access routes for the movement of vessel traffic proceeding to and from ports or places along the western seaboard of the United States, and to determine whether the ship, the, a shipping safety fairway and or routing measures should be established, adjusted, or modified. The PACPARS is evaluating the continued applicability of and the need for modifications to current vessel routing measures. The goal of PACPARS is to enhance navigational safety by examining existing shipping routes and waterways and to the extent practical, uh, reconciling the paramount rights of navigation within designated port access routes with other waterways uses, such as the development of aquaculture farms, offshore renewable energy, commercial space, ports, re-entry sites, marine sanctuaries, ports supporting Panamax vessels, potential LNG ports, and additional commercial vessel traffic. The Coast Guard is, has solicited and received input from other federal agencies, this council, the states, and other stakeholders. We are currently modeling and analyzing the data before publishing our results. Uh, second to last slide. We'd be remiss if we didn't mention the contributions and efforts of our partner agencies in protected marine resources off the West Coast. A shout out to the other members of the enforcement consultants, um, Oregon State Patrol, NOAA OLE, uh, GCES, WDFW, and CDFW enforcement, along with the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans and our tribal partners. Lastly, thank you to Dr. Seeger of the council staff for establishing, for ensuring the Coast Guard and our enforcement partners are truly included in the council process. This concludes our report. Admiral Bubalis and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Commander Ettinger. Uh, let's see if there are any questions uh, from around the council table of either the Rear Admiral or the Lieutenant Commander. Bob Dooley. Oh, pardon Butch, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, no questions, um, gentlemen, ladies. It's just a big heartfelt thank from a coastal community on the service of what you do for our fishing communities all up and down the West Coast. And uh, I, you know, I'm personally one that's trying to get a new asset for the 52-footer through Senator Cantwell's office and, and her assistant that works in the Commerce Department. We're still working on that issue to hope we get... Uh, either the 52 replaced or or back in action because it is an asset that we need on the on the coast for our bigger vessels but i want to thank um for what you do and the coast guard in our communities also so thank you well thank you i appreciate that um i will make a few comments about that we have <clears throat> we have plans for uh, replacing the 52 uh, you know, as the operational commander for those assets, uh, I, I don't have any plans to put the 52s back into service. Uh, they're very capable assets and, you know, it makes me proud to uh, know their history and their heritage, but they're 60 years old, you know, and they, they don't need to be out there any longer. There's, there's better, more capable, more reliable assets that will better serve the community and, and support our people uh, better. So there are some plans for that. Uh, appreciate your support as well. I think external support helps us execute our plans. Let me just leave it at that. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. Phil, and then Bob. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, just have a few, few comments. Um, first of all, thank you very much for, for being here today. Um, We've been uh, blessed here in the council with having um, 
uh, the, the participation and the leadership from both the 13th and the 11th district. Um, you have um, uh, provided us great uh, representatives here that have that are highly valued. Um, um, and um, so I wanted to acknowledge acknowledge those folks um, because they truly provided us excellent representation and, and assistance. Um, I've got I've got a little over four thousand days of experience on the ocean days on the ocean, and so you, the uh, Coast Guard's um, mission in terms of this the, the portion dealing with safety at sea is particularly. Uh, near and dear to me, um, and as Mr. Smith said, um, the safety aspect of the the uh, Coast Guard to the recreational and commercial fishing industry is extremely important, and you've saved countless lives with your efforts. Um, the fishery enforce on the fishery enforcement side, uh, I, I would just say that both from a domestic and international perspective, uh, what you do is invaluable to us. It, it enables us, without it, we wouldn't be successful in managing our fisheries. Um, your at sea presence, just uh, the importance of that can't be overstated. It's hard, really hard work but um, it, it, the, the presence at sea is just invaluable. As you, you mentioned, uh, our enforcement consultant group and the, the um, which is, um, has representatives and was acknowledged uh, by our uh, other state fish and wildlife enforcement entities uh, and the enforcement consultants provide the, the council uh, great advice uh, ensure that we're looking and adopting regulations that are enforceable and the Coast Guard's participation on that is is very, very important. Um, I was I had the invincible on my list, <laughs> the, the 52 foot invincible. Um, as, as Mr. Smith said, there are some of us that that recognize just how important those vessels have been to the uh, to the um, safety of the commercial and recreational fleets and their and their capacity and abilities. I've had um, conversations um, with the, uh, Lieutenant Scott McGrew about about those assets. I'm very happy to hear that you're pursuing uh, replacement vessels uh, for those. Totally understand. Uh, you're you're uh, not wanting to put those vessels back at sea and back in service, um, uh, and at the same time recognize the important role that they played uh, in our lifeboat stations. And so, uh, you have a lot of you have some of us that are working from the outside to try to assist you in getting funding to replace those those assets. So, once again, thank you very very much for being here, and. Uh, for all that, that you do for our industry, our commercial and recreational fishery, uh, and your service to the council. Well, thank you for that again. And uh, Brett mentioned that we are changing out some of our uh, resources. We're getting the FRC these fast response cutters, 154 foot cutters. And I have no doubt that they're gonna help uh, give us greater presence uh, for doing those enforcement operations. They, they have uh, much greater capability uh, within close distance of uh, shore within a couple, you know, 100 miles or so. So that, that really is going to be a game changer for us as far as presence, I believe. Thank you. Great, right, Bob Dooley, followed by Maggie Summer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Admiral, really good to see your presence here today. It, means, it makes a big difference. Um, I'm a California representative, as you can tell, and so I'm very familiar with District 11, but although I've spent my career in Alaska as well as the West Coast and many interactions with your district as well. So um, appreciate all you do. I echo exactly what Phil and Butch had said. I, um, <clears throat> I have worked closely with Peg Murphy in uh, District 11 to work with safety issues with commercial fishing vessels, organized town halls with her 
when we were going through the alternative compliance issues. I, uh, I, I really appreciate the, the relationship and the, the, the ability or the, the, for, the desire for, to keep the, the channels open and work together. And I've had nothing but a good experience. Spent 40 years on the ocean fishing. Um, you're, when your vessel's coming over the horizon, it's, the, it's a welcome sight every time. Sometimes more, more welcome than others when, we, when we're in trouble. And I really appreciate that over time. I uh, am a member also, or a former member of the Commercial Fishing Safety uh, Vessel Advisory Committee, although it's been dis dismantled and waiting for appointment to the next one and whenever that happens. So I'm a member of that as well, or was a member, hope to be a member again. Um, I just can't thank you guys enough. You're, you're, you're part of the family here and that's, that's important. You're, we're do really good service and a lot of work. I do have a couple of questions, uh, for Lieutenant Commander Brett Edinger on his presentation, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. We're in the question period now, so please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. I was looking at your, uh, slide eight in particular and noted that uh, boardings and, and violations were up, safety violations were up in 2021. And I'm wondering if that is a reflection of more effort on the ocean to uncover those, or is that a reflection of more work needs to be done by all of us to, uh, to get people into compliance and, and awareness? Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Dooley. Um, I think it's a, a combination answer. Um, 2021 saw an increased number of boardings and with more boardings, typically we find more violations, whether it's uh, a fisheries violation, safety violation, et cetera. Um, 2020 was, was relatively austere due to COVID. Um, every, everybody was operating at a reduced capacity, both uh, Coast Guard enforcement on the water and then uh, fishermen out on the water, both recreation and commercial. Um, so the opportunity for those boardings. Um, but we have put more boots on deck, um, resulting in, in more boardings. Uh, I, I would foot stomp. Um, the, the dockside exams for the commercial fleet um, have increased. Um, which has helped some of those safety violations on the commercial fleet. Um, we don't have any any sort of parity for the recreational fleet. Um, so a, a huge lion's share of those um, violations were from, from rec safety. Um, that was 75% of our boardings last year. Well, I, yeah, I noticed that uh, from 2017, 18, 19, that those safety violations were down. And then I, I know 2020 is 2020. That was a the COVID year, but 2021, it seems like it's, we're on an upward trend there. And I'm, I'm hoping that that's added focus and not just uh, the industry getting lax on safety. Through the chair, I, I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah, if I'm if I'm using my assessment, um, we rip through all of our boarding numbers um, quarterly. Um, we have a review that goes up to our admiral um, through a, a planning directive. Um, we're doing more, but we are seeing more on the water. Um, and I think it is uh, the fishermen that laid up in 20, going back out in 21, and maybe not checking their flares, their emergencies, et cetera. Um, so th there is some work to be done there, sir. Mr. Chairman, I have one follow-up if that's okay. All right. Uh, again, on thank you for that. I appreciate it. On slide 12, uh, and, and some accompanying slides from there, you um, that has to do with the coastal rain, the puffin, the de desire, the blue dragon, and those those issues. Did those vessels have uh, safety stickers, or were they were they in compliance, or were they not? For the coastal rain, um, I know they had had a um, they were within compliance within the previous two years, um, so they had their. Or, um, dockside. Um, I'm unsure about the puffin, um, and then the desire and the blue dragon both had uh, current CFE inspections as well. 
Thank you. That's that's good to know. I appreciate it. And thank you guys for being here today and and really appreciate you. Thank you. Great. Right, thanks, Bob. Uh, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, and thank you very much for coming, uh, being here and for this annual report. We, we appreciate it and uh, certainly echo everyone's uh, thanks for your, your, um, the scope of your mission overall. I represent the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, wanted to express our, our particular appreciation for collaboration with the Coast Guard uh, who have been working with us and with Oregon State University on some research flights and the access to your assistance and some of your aircraft, uh, for example, in documentation of whale distribution has been very valuable uh, and we, we certainly appreciate it. So I wanted to offer my thanks. <laughs> For the chair, I guess yes, I need please, to understand ahead. the appropriate protocol. I no, didn't I, mean to be, I, uh, I treated uh, that as a question directed to you, so please okay. go ahead. Uh, well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate the acknowledgement. And um, again, we want to be good partners. I got to tell you that it, this is this is very comfortable and, and welcoming for my first one. You know, I wasn't sure what we were going to be getting into here, but uh, uh, as a second generation Coast Guard member. It really warms my heart, touches my spirit to hear that the folks that were that are primary customers are happy with what we're doing and, and it's being meaningful. And if I may comment to uh, Mr. Dooley's uh, question or comments about those upticks, uh, you know, there's some other things that were going on the the crab season i think opened a little bit early and uh we were concerned we had actually some intelligence where we were looking at the size of the fleets and how many folks were going to get out on the water so we purposefully put more resource time there to try and uh, ensure that people did it safely and we expected to see some some challenges because folks were coming out of layup and and i think we the economics and the season just drove more people to get out there than uh, perhaps had been out there before. And that's when we need to be there. We need to make sure that, you know, people are safe and uh, we're doing the appropriate uh, policing or encouraging that that safe activity. Uh, and on the other vessel, um, Puffin, I think it was, uh, if we can go back one or two for the slides, not Puffin, the next one. Uh, 14, slide 14, Des yeah, desire. If I remember right, this is the, uh, this is the one where this is textbook, you know, safety. Folks were trained, prepared, had e -perbs, they made contact. Uh, we sent aircraft out and from my perspective, and I review every single case that, uh, that gets reported out in, in the district, um, this was uh, just very responsible uh, professional fishermen that had the right equipment, uh, the right preparation, made the contact at the right time, and it resulted in, in five lives saved, if I recall. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? I think you can tell there's a lot of love here for the Coast Guard. And so uh, this may be your first visit here, but um, you're always welcome. And uh, hopefully we can continue to have the annual Coast Guard report um, on our agenda. So let me see if there's anything else. Corey Ridings. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Wasn't quite sure of the protocol. Um, thank you, Rear Admiral, for being here today. Um, it's nice to meet you and see you. Um, I wanted to briefly voice my appreciation for your designees and just add a little bit to what the previous council members have said. Um, I've been coming to council meetings for just shy of a decade, and most of that has been as a member of the public representing the conservation community. And your designees have always been um, incredibly professional, very welcoming, kind, knowledgeable, and I just wanted to say how much I appreciated that as a member of the public. Um, and now it's even better to be working even more closely with your designees and um, especially Lieutenant Commander Ettinger and Lieutenant Lingo who have are really the gold standard as was Greg Kassad before them. 
So um, thank you for sending us your best. And uh, one last note, as a former observer in the North Pacific, thank you very much. <laughs> really appreciated um, what you did and the trainings I got and, and what you do. So thanks, thanks to all of you. Chairman, thank you. I really appreciate that as well. I, I would tell you that um, I hear your remarks and I share your opinion about the caliber and quality of, of these two fine officers, uh, but I got a stable full of them. I tell you, the Coast Guard really has exceptional people and uh, all the way down to the waterfront. And if you uh, are so inclined and have opportunity, we're hiring as well, and we're interested in getting more people into the service. So uh, continue to add to that, that, uh, that great workforce. And, and again, Thank you for acknowledging our folks. I'm very proud of them. Well, thank you, Admiral. Let's see if there are any other questions. Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also don't have a question, but I do have a comment. So I will say my piece and, and really thank the Rear Admiral, but also the staff, particularly regarding um, the slides and the information on IUU. I spend a lot of time with the North Pacific Albacore fleet. We have a lot of concern about what's going on out on the water and the ability to see um, what is going on out there um, to help strengthen positions around um, anti-shark finning or, or IUU in general is very helpful. So thanks for including that in today's report and uh, keep up the great work. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And um, I don't know how many people may have seen, I think it was publicly displayed the Coast Guard's, uh, the State of the Coast Guard address by Admiral Schultz. And uh, IUU is, is one of those literally global international issues that, that we are giving a significant amount of time and attention. And, uh, when we talk about you know the global fishing stocks, that, that truly is important. So I appreciate you acknowledging that and the amount of effort that we put into it. Our national security cutters that can go and operate globally, uh, and our partnerships with with other nations. I'm thinking um, in Indo-PACOM and Micronesian Asian or areas. Uh, you know we're we're really trying to make an impact and presence there. Uh, there's some other. Uh, benefits to being present uh, on the world stage as well, but uh, the fisheries are, are vitally important. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anything further from around the table? Yeah. Vice Chair. <laughs> thank you, Chair Grovick. Grov uh, just a second, all the good things that uh, folks have said about the uh, Coast Guard. I've. Um, a long time commercial fisherman, um, vessel owner. Um, my first time being towed in by golly was about 1970 with my father, uh, two division behind the Coast Guard cutter Modoc, which has um, been long since retired. Um, and um, what many people don't know is my 13 year old son that was rescued off a cliff down in Brookings uh, by a Coast Guard helicopter. So it was just not, it's just not in the water. And so uh, I really, extra appreciation uh, for what you do, what, uh, what, what uh, Coast Guard does for, uh, for, the, for our communities. Um, I'm a little bit curious about the 52 foot, two footer uh, replacement situation. And is there a, is there a design been uh, selected or is that in the process of, and just a little background because it's kind of, I was aware of this situation because I know that uh, Coos Bay lost uh, their, I believe the Intrepid, I believe here also. And so um, the need to have a replacement vessel. And so um, uh, as I engage with our uh, congressional folks, I'd, uh, yeah, but what, where are we at on that? And um, uh, what's the timeline for getting a replacement vessel in service potentially with funding? Thank you. Thank you. Let me, uh pause here for a moment because there's probably more going on than I would be appropriate for me to share publicly, if that makes sense. Uh, is there a design? No, there's not a design. 
there are there is an acquisition process that the Coast Guard follows. Um, we have identified all of the uh, requirements for the replacement of the 52, uh, realize the organizations evolved over time in the 60 years that we built and employed those assets, and now we have more formal acquisition processes. So when we go to replace a certain capability, we, have, we do a mission needs study to determine really what we need uh, operationally to execute our missions. And then we determine, is there, are there other means by which we could accomplish that? Uh, or do we have a material solution? Or do we have to get to a material solution, buying something, an asset, and uh, manning and staffing it and operating it? Uh, that is all completed. So we know we need a ship or we know we need a replacement. Uh, the program has stood up, the acquisition program. There's people to manage that. Uh, we do not have resource fiscal resources for it. We have put it on what we call an unfunded priority list, which just by the, the nature of the name, UPL, unfunded priority list, it is a priority for the organization. But as we go through the uh, budget development and the challenges that we face uh, with recapitalizing other assets, making sure our folks are paid and uh, we're addressing, you know, needs of the organization to include infrastructure, which is quite a need in the Pacific Northwest, but across the whole Coast Guard. Uh, it did not reach a level where it was funded within the president's budget. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on there. We'd be happy to execute it or, and, and step out on the acquisition as soon as possible. As soon as possible is when funds get designated for the project. Let me update you even more. So the program has done what they call RFI, request for information. So we've put out our requirements to industry. Uh, we have gotten feedback from industry. I am confident that there are U.S. manufacturers who can meet the needs of the material solution. I'm confident enough that there are some parent designs that are out there that can easily be tweaked and tuned to the meet the Coast Guard's requirements. We do have some rigid requirements as far as, you know, these are boats that go into the surf and they plow through some, some nasty weather. They got to be able to tow uh, big boats and uh, handle the water or what handle the um, waves. And uh, we have requirements for stability and survivability. They've got to be able to roll in the surf, come back up and keep going. And that, that takes some significant uh, engineering design that most folks don't design their boats to. So there's there's some tweaking, but I'm I'm confident that we can get there uh, quickly when we have resourcing. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Anything further from around the table? All right. Uh, I don't believe there's any public comment here, which we typically provide public comment at each agenda item, but. We don't see any here. And this is where we would have any further council discussion. We've had a fair amount already, but i um, not gonna shut the door or anything further. We have time. So is there anything further from the council or from the Coast Guard on this report? I'm not seeing, uh, Butch Smith. How about a big thank you and a round of applause. And well, I'd have yeah, to return the same time. Favor. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate the uh, collaboration again. All right. Well, that concludes this agenda item. Um, we still have business to do uh, today, but we're going to take our lunch break now. Uh, there's some planning needs to be done for tomorrow. So we'll break now and we'll be back at one o'clock and we'll take up our remaining ground fish item, conclude F4, and hopefully concludes them and fingers crossed. So we'll see everyone back here at one o'clock.
All right, welcome back from lunch. Um, we'll pick up our, our last ground fish item, F4. And for that, I'll pass the gavel to our vice chair, Brad Pettinger. Thank you, Joe, Chair Grolnick. And uh, with that, let's see, we've uh, finished with our reports, public comment. And uh, go to Todd, yes, that's right. Todd? Yes. <laughs> Start us off, please. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Council, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yes, um, yesterday, as you are, you just articulated, we uh, the, the council discussed, or the council heard all the reports from the varying advisory bodies as well as public comment. Um, you have you essentially delayed um, future. Or <laughs> my brain is kind of laxing them. You delayed the, uh, the, con the conclusion of that item until today to give the council some time to think on things and you are set for council discussion and council action as appropriate under this uh, agenda item for right now. Thank you. Okay, questions for Todd on that overview? All right, with that, I will open the floor for discussion. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Vice Chair. I just wanted to um, acknowledge the all of the the work um, that, and the preparation that has set us up well for uh, considering our action here. We have a number of GMT reports, and the action item checklist um, really helps us keep on top of all the moving pieces within this this item. Um, and I believe um, that we will be following the the numbering of the action item checklist and probably relying substantially on reports, not just from the GMT, but the states and the tribes as well in, in motions. Uh, and I'll be prepared to um, offer one to address a few of those uh, when we're when we're ready. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, seeing hands. So I guess we'd uh, a motion, perhaps? Job? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a motion for the uh, council. Uh, if Sandra could get the motion on the screen. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, so this will be the uh, travel motion. I move the council adopt as preliminary preferred alternative, the preliminary travel set aside shown as item E5A supplemental travel report to November, 2021. Thank you, Joe. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Okay, second. Second by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Can you please speak to your motion, uh, Joe? Yes, thank you. Um, so the Council adopted the draft travel set aside as reflective, reflected, excuse me, in item E5A supplemental travel report to uh, from November 2021. The coastal tribes have requested no further adjustments uh, to the set asides or harvest guidelines at this time. These travel harvest guidelines and set asides are consistent with the set asides requested for the 2021 2022 biennium, with the exception of Pacific Ocean perch and dark blotch rockfish. In November, the tribes requested an increase for the Pacific Ocean perch from 9.2 to 130 metric ton and dark blotch rockfish from 0.2 to 5 metric ton. Both of these changes are expected to have negligible effects on the non treaty fisheries, but will provide needed relief within the tribal fisheries. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Joe. All right. Questions for the motion maker or discussion on the motion? Okay. I'm not seeing any, so 
um, a call for the question. All those in favor signify, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. Abst abstentions? Okay. Motion passes unanimously. That was a. Okay. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, okay. I guess Maggie Summer. Thank you, Vice Chair. I'd like to offer motion number two from ODFW. I move the council adopt preliminary preferred alternatives as recommended in F3A supplemental GMT reports three and four for the following items. Uh, maybe Sandra or Chris, after GMT reports three and four, would you please add in April 2022? Thanks. For the following items. Number three, off the top deductions for research EFPs and incidental open access fisheries. Number eight, our harvest guidelines and state shares for stocks in the complex. Number 10, within trawl set-asides. Number 11, within non-trawl harvest guidelines, annual catch targets or shares. Number 13, shore-based IFQ trip limits for non-IFQ species. 14A, open access north of 4010. 15A, limited entry fixed gear north of 4010 and Oregon recreational measures. Set number 17. Thank you, Maggie. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, thanks. Okay, for a second. Second by Krista Swinson. Thank you, Krista. Please speak to your motion, Maggie. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, again, appreciate all of the analysis and recommendations provided to us by uh, the Groundfish Management Team, uh, as well as um, input from the Groundfish Advisory subpanel. Um, I relied uh, on the uh, rationale provided along with the recommendations by the GMT um, and, and don't intend to repeat that here. Uh, I'm simply going to comment on a few of these items of, of I think a particular note about which the council has had some discussion on some, some uh, heightened interest. Um, I'll begin with uh, just number eight, harvest guidelines and state shares for stocks in a complex. Uh, this one does include uh, black gill rockfish and the GMT recommended continuing using the custom approach to that to allocate black gill rockfish and other slope rockfish to the trawl and non-trawl sectors and it seems to be uh, meeting the needs. Um, and for the uh, the Oregon Black, Blue, and Deacon Rockfish Complex, as well as the Oregon and Washington Cabazon and Kelp Greenling Complexes, uh, appreciate the GMT's review of recent catch levels, as well as uh, the Washington Cabazon overfishing limit level, uh, and the, agree with the GMT's recommendation that there's no need for harvest guidelines for component stocks of those complexes. Number 10 on the within trawl set asides for the at sea whiting sectors. Uh, we have had some conversation about spiny dogfish at this meeting. The GMT is not recommending establishing a spiny dogfish set aside because of the stock's annual variability in catch and uh, dependent on the uh, Pacific whiting tack, season start date, and other factors. There's no IFQ allocation of spiny dogfish. It's not a target species um, and a an amount of set aside of at sea mortality isn't necessary. Uh, noting again that the at sea sectors are already taking measures to avoid stocks of concern, including spiny dogfish and the GMT has indicated they will uh, track catch data as it's available in season. The council can consider spatial management tools in areas of high bycatch uh, via in season action if that's the appropriate route to go. Uh, although again, I, I, Note that the industry action uh, uh, is helpful there. For number 11, the within non trawl harvest guidelines, ACTs, and shares, this does include the canary uh, allocations within the non trawl allocation overall. Uh, certainly, the subject of canary allocations has been uh, a focus of quite a bit of interest. 
because they are caught in really every one of our fisheries, whether as a target stock or an incidental, incidentally encountered stock, including highly variable encounters at the individual vessel level. GMT provided some impacts, uh, some information on impacts in the non-trawl sector at our March meeting. Currently seeing attainment levels below 50% 50 50 in both the uh, non-trawl sector as well as the trawl sector. Um, and really would highlight here again that we are managing the non-trawl sectors subdivisions with harvest guidelines, which are soft caps and allow for flexible management. Harvest guidelines are defined in the fishery management plan and in federal ground fish regulations as a specified numerical harvest objective, which is not a quota. Attainment of a harvest guideline does not require closure of a fishery. And I would uh, certainly reaffirm our intent here not to close fisheries uh, uh, or impose restrictions unless necessary, unless there is uh, potentially a risk to the ACL. And certainly the council can review attainment uh, within the non-trawl sector or within both sectors, fishery conditions and any other relevant information and consider any uh, whether any alternative allocations should be considered next biennium. Uh, under number 13, uh, again, this is the shore-based IFQ trip limits for species that aren't part of the IFQ program. Uh, also here on spiny dogfish, the GMT considered a lower trip limit, but compared to existing industry avoidance measures and potential use of block area closures, a lower spiny dogfish trip limit would not be effective and could ne uh, negatively impact fishery value. On 14A and 15A, the trip limits for open access and uh, limited entry north of 4010, these do include the, cop the quillback and copper trip limits uh, with the GMT's recommendation of status quo, which, uh, which status quo is the limits adopted via in-season action last November to reduce mortality off California. We heard a little bit of information earlier under in-season about how those are working. Uh, and then uh, finally, Oregon recreational measures uh, we presented in the ODFW report and the GMT reviewed. This does um, include the addition of allowing long leader gear fishing on the same trip as all depth Pacific halibut. That concludes my remarks. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, question for Maggie. <clears throat> Did you mean F4A in the first line? Yes, I did. Thank you. Thank you. Well, okay. <laughs> Does someone want to amend that motion? Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'd move to amend the first line of the motion to reflect, um, scroll back down so I can see it, <laughs> please. Uh, 4A, rather, F4A rather than F3A. Is that accurate, Bob? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Seconded by uh, Butch Smith. Thank you, Butch. All right. Well, I think no reason to talk about this. <laughs> so I just hope not. Um, with that, I'll call for the question uh, to amend it to the motion. Um, all those in favor signify by saying uh, uh, aye. 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 Those no. Abstentions? Okay. We've got a unanimous uh, vote on the uh, amended motion. Uh, all right, uh, so, so now we have a, a minute motion that's uh, on the floor, so Phil Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Maggie, for the motion. Um, I know I've been a bit pesky in my concern about canary rockfish as it relates to the Washington Recreational Fishery, um, and I appreciate um, in Maggie's discussion uh, behind the rationale of the motion, the description and understanding that we've had 
relatively low attainment of both the trawl and non-trawl trawl allocations as a whole. Um, and that these harvest guidelines are, are, are soft caps, if you will, and allow for flexible management and the um, and her, her discussion around an affirmation that that these um, values are not intended uh, to be used to uh, restrict uh, fisheries, obviously, unless the ACL uh, were to, to be in of a concern, which in the case of Canary is, is highly unlikely. So um, appreciate those comments and I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you, Phil, for the discussion. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so we'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, I have a WDF motion to offer. I move that the council select the GMT recommendations for items six, six B and seven from the enhanced action item checklist in agenda item F4A Supplemental GMT Report 3, April 2022, and the GMT recommendations for items 12F, 12G, 12J, and 16 from the enhanced item action item checklist and agenda item F4A. Supplemental GMT Report 4, April 2022, as preliminary preferred alternatives. For reference, item 6 are the preliminary two-year trawl, non-trawl allocations. Item 6B um, is the rebuilding species allocation for yellow eye rockfish. Item 7 is preliminary amendment 21, trawl, non-trawl species allocations. Item 12F is the amendment to extend the primary sablefish season end date from October 31 to December 31. Item 12G is the amendment to correct the FMP language for block area closures. Item 12J is the midwater trawl block area closure analysis. And item 16 is the Washington recreational bag limits, seasons, lengths, length limits, et cetera. Okay. Okay, Heather, is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, for a second. Second by Butch Smith. Thank you, Butch. Okay, Heather, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, these uh, really are based off the GMT's recommendations, and uh, which I think in many cases were supported by the GAP as well. Uh, so I won't go into great detail on those. Um, uh, for uh, action item um, six, uh, the GMT recommends the status quo allocations here as PPA. Um, and that's based on looking at uh, sector attainment, um, which with the exception of yellow eye rockfish aren't expected to constrain either the trawl or non-trawl sectors. Uh, similar to the discussion under the last motion, uh, this also includes uh, the um, two-year allocations for canary rockfish. And I, I mentioned this here um, just to um, mention that in November that we asked, WDFW asked the GMT to look at canary rockfish. Um, uh, specifically, and um, WDFW pro provided a report in March that looked at some more detail on canary rockfish attainment in the Washington recreational fishery. Um, that re report explained that recreational catch in 2021 did um, come close to the Washington harvest guideline. Uh, we also explained that in 2023 and 2024, um, we could see um, 
increased canary catch uh, based on the proposed changes to the uh, non trawl RCA, but it still seems unlikely that the non trawl sector will exceed the non trawl allocation. And even more broadly, um, that the risk to the ACL for canary rockfish uh, is expected to remain low. Um, so we haven't proposed any formal changes to allocations for 2023 and 2024. Um, but one of the key points in the WDFW report um, was the challenge of understanding sector needs um, as, the count, as rebuilding restrictions for canary rockfish have been lifted. Uh, this is particularly true for a stock like canary rockfish that is caught across almost every fishery sector. Um, I just note that the council's approach to canary rockfish has been cautious and incremental. Uh, that's very similar to the approach taken for Washington uh, recreational fishery. Um, so just uh, flagging that even though we're not proposing changes here, uh, we see the evaluation of sector needs as an ongoing discussion. Um, action item seven adopts a preliminary um, Amendment 21, trial non trial species allocations. Um, and let's see, action item 12. These are part of the new management measure analysis. Um, 12F is the amendment to extend the primary sablefish season end date from October 31 to December 31. Um, we've heard from industry members that this uh, action would provide additional flexibility to um, allow full attainment of the primary tier limits and increase sablefish attainment overall, um, providing economic benefits to the, the fixed gear sector and fishing communities. Um, the reasons for the um, October 31 end date were to provide uh, time to track changes or track catch. Uh, so the annual allocation was not exceeded and uh, that that is no longer needed, which much uh, faster and more efficient catch accounting. Um, I would note that um, the GMT did highlight that this could increase the amount of time that humpback whales are likely to co-occur with the primary tier fishery. Um, but also that the likelihood of that um, co-occurrence um, decreases from October to December of this time period where the extension would be in place. This is another place where both the GAP and the GMT support a sub-option two. Uh, this would extend the incidental Pacific halibut, halibut allowance for the primary tier fishery uh, to the date or time specified by IPHC or until the allocation is attained, whichever comes first, uh, which just increases the flexibility um, for this fishery. Uh, 12F is the amendment to correct the FMP language for block area closures. Uh, the GMT recommends that the council amend the FMP to align the definition of block area closures with federal regulations. Um, I think that's uh, pretty straightforward. 12J is um, the midwater trawl block, block area closure analysis. Um, the GMT has been investigating spatial management tools for mitigating spiny dogfish bycatch in, in the trawl sectors as directed by the council um, in the GMT's report number two, under this agenda item, they note that um, BRAs would be too broad of a tool and uh, wouldn't capture the abundance distribution of, spe of specific spiny dogfish. Um, and so the GMT's recommendation um, is to not conduct any further analysis on BRAs for bottom trawl gear. Um, this um, motion supports the GMT's effort to provide an update on the use of BACs for groundfish bycatch mitigation pur purposes by midwater trawl gear, coast wide, and bottom trawl gear off Washington, um, as described in their report, too. 
Um, and I would just note the gaps comments on this uh, that really um, the um, the first line of defense for responding to um, incidental catch of non-target species, including spining dogfish, um, is really the industry's um, voluntary actions, uh, which can be effective, but their support for these tools in the toolbox, um, just to give the council the um, most flexibility. And then action item 16 is the Washington recreational um, season structure. The GMT recommends adopting the PPAs for the Washington recreational fishery um, for 2023 and 2024. Um, the PPA includes no retention for copper, quillback, and vermilion rockfish um, while maintaining um, several status quo measures such as the season length limit and daily bag limits. Um, the details of that are in the WDFW report um, under this agenda item. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, questions for Heather or a discussion on the motion? Okay. Seeing no hands, I'll call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those no. Abstentions. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And then um, we'll go to California next, but uh, we need to have a little break here. I've been requested uh, 10 minutes as possible. So if uh, we're going to pause here and uh, Come back here around uh, 127, 128, something like that. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> that would be now, uh, 137.
Okay, if we can take our seats here, we'll get going. All right, um, we're back in session here. Oh, we lost our tribal member. Ah, okay. We're back in session and uh, we'll turn to California and uh, Marcy Rimko. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Sandra, I'm just checking that you've received the updated motion. All right. There we go. Thank you, Sandra. So I'll be working from the action item checklist and we'll move the council adopt the following management measures as preliminary preferred alternatives for items 2, 5, 12E, 14B, 15B, 18 and a few others that I'll just walk through as we go. All right. Um, number two, area management. Uh, adopt the non-trawl RCA waypoint corrections as per GMT recommendation in supplemental GMT report three and CDFW enforcement recommendation uh, that's included in supplemental CDFW report five. On item five, ACTs for yellow eye, adopt the status quo non trawl ACT of 39.8 metric tons. For CalCOD, adopt removal of the 50 metric ton ACT as per the gap recommendation contained in supplemental gap report one. For quillback rockfish off of California, do not identify a PPA, but request further analysis of the following. Option one, from 42 to 4010 north latitude, set the ACT equal to the SPR of 0 0.06 from the rebuilding analysis. For 4010 to the US-Mexico border, set the ACT equal to SPR 0.6 from the rebuilding analysis. Option two for 42 to 4010, set the ACT equal to the ACL contribution to the complex. For 4010 to the US-Mexico border, set ACT equal to ACL contribution to complex. For copper rockfish off of California, do not identify a PPA, but request further analysis of the following. Option one, from 42 to 4010, set ACT equal to ACL contribution to the complex. From 4010 to the US-Mexico border, set ACT equal to ACL contribution to the complex. For option two, from 42 to 4010, set ACT equal to the ACL contribution to the complex with a 4010 reduction applied. And for 4010 to the US-Mexico border, set the ACT equal to ACL contribution to the complex with the 4010 reduction applied. Scrolling down on item 12E, this is the non-trawl RCA item. Adopt revised proposal as described in the NIMS report, including the gap and EC modifications, and those are from the NIMS report one. Uh, supplemental gap report one and supplemental EC report one. For 12H, the CDFW recreational bag limits 
adopt the recreational bag limits as described in section six of agenda item F4 attachment two. For 12I, the CDFW recreational RCA management measures adopt the novel utilization of existing RCA boundary lines as described in section seven of agenda item F4 attachment two. Item 14B, this is for open access south of 4010, adopt the status quo trip limits as per the gap recommendation and supplemental gap report one. 15B, this is for limited entry fixed gear south of 4010, adopt the status quo trip limits as per gap recommendation in supplemental gap report one. And number 18, California recreational, adopt the range of season structure and bag limit scenarios in CDFW report one from agenda item F4A. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marcy. Um, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, before you go to a second, a clarification, uh, Marcy, under Quillback Rockfish, option one, the first bullet 42 to 4010. I see 0. 0.6 on the screen. I heard 0. 0.06. I believe 0.6 is correct, but just thought we should be clear for the record. Point, yes, thank you. Uh, 0.6 as it shows on the screen. Thank you. Okay, very good. So um, with that, um, Marcy, is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Thank you. Very good. Second? Second by um, Chair Grolnick. Please speak to your motion, Marcy. Thank you. Um, so item two, this, this is area management. Um, this is about adopting corrections to the waypoints uh, as the GMT has recommended here, uh, as well as a late breaking um, proposed change that came from CDFW enforcement this meeting in supplemental report five. Um, just to kind of reflect on this, uh, these are routine corrections that we have been supplying um, into the briefing book under this agenda item now for Oh, uh, the last several um, meetings under management measures. And um, we've been collecting these proposed waypoint changes over the past uh, biennial cycle um, with the idea that we would include all of the needed corrections and crossovers in the biennial cycle. Uh, that's something we started doing last cycle, and it's a process that really has has worked. Um, you might remember in, in years past, we actually would take up uh, individual actions to correct waypoints and crossovers. And um, this, this method, while um, maybe not super timely for some changes that are needed, um, it is an effective way to... Um, incorporate the changes um, on a set timeline and schedule. And so we've been kind of uh, pounding the pavement, asking for folks uh, changes that are needed um, to um, make the use of waypoints easier uh, and to aid enforcement and to improve um, clarity. So uh, we did a pretty thorough uh, examination of all of the waypoints off California uh, this cycle. And um, as you've seen in several CDFW reports over the, the months, um, we do propose a number of changes. Um, and we do think uh, the commercial fishermen and the sport fishermen and the enforcement officers that have um, provided us with some very uh, important changes that will, I think, um, aid the use of this management tool and appreciate the uh, the gap and the uh, enforcement consultants uh, review on this and their support. So uh, also appreciate the work in the background from National Marine Fisheries Service because there are a lot of changes and a lot of waypoints off California. Um, but again, I think it really has improved the, the uh, use of the tool for now and into the future. Um, moving to ACTs. Um, for yellow eye, we support the uh, PPA of the status quo regarding yellow, the yellow eye non trawl ACT of 39.8 metric tons. That's a recommendation um, from both the GMT and GAP. Uh, CalCOD, similarly, to remove the 50 ton ACT 
Uh, it's also supported by the GAP and uh, the GMT. With regard to Quillback, um, we had quite a discussion in our specifications item about uh, ACLs, and now we are moving to uh, the point where we consider uh, a PPA for ACTs. And uh, we're not quite ready to identify PPA at this time, but would request further analysis of the following alternatives as shown in option one, uh, where we would set the ACT equal to the SPR of 0 0.6, and that would come from the rebuilding analysis. And similarly for 4010 to the US-Mexico border, uh, do the same. For option two, this would set the ACT equal to the ACL contribution to the complex uh, for both areas, uh, 42 to 4010, and then 4010 to the US-Mexico border. For copper rockfish, uh, option one, would be to set the ACL uh, equal to the ACT uh, for the complex. And then again, for the Southern complex from 4010 to the US-Mexico border, set the ACT equal to the ACL. Um, additionally, um, for option two under copper rockfish, this would be setting the ACT equal to the ACL contribution to the complex and applying the 4010 reduction, again, both north and south of, uh, for both the north and south um, complexes. Um, we'd like to ask the um, GMT to conduct further analysis on these ACT options and report back at the June meeting. Um, they are intended to work with the range of ACL alternatives identified under the specs agenda item. Um, the gap in the industry uh, have made clear how important quillback is to sport and commercial fishing operations in order to access other healthy stocks. Um, in considering the application of the rebuilding analysis, um, we are wanting the, the ability to balance the needs of the fishery while taking into consideration the status of the stock. Um, those rebuilding plans or analyses that we adopted um, for use in management uh, are considered best available science. We had a lengthy discussion about that under the specs item. So um, using them to uh, identify ACT alternatives here in this action uh, is likewise appropriate. Um, if NIFS had been able to declare the California portion of the stock overfished, uh, we would be managing under this rebuilding analysis um, in using the uh, SPR harvest rate from the analysis does allow the council to consider the time to rebuild um, and the probability of rebuilding by T target. Um, option two that would set the ACT equal to the ACL contribution uh, based on the stock assessment. Um, this would use the harvest specs from the stock assessment with the 4010 reduction applied. Um, and setting the ACT equal to the ACL contribution has routinely been used to manage stocks in a complex that require additional precaution. So um, we would have that alternative um, for consideration as well. Um, moving to copper rockfish, um, just wanting to again, request the uh, analysis um, from the GMT uh, as to the ACTs. Um, CDFW agrees with um, the recommendations that came initially out of the groundfish uh, subcommittee of the SSC 
to pool the California assessments uh, for status determination. Um, and as a result, um, because they've been combined for status, um, that population, when, when the assessments are pooled, uh, comes in at 31.7% of unfished spawning biomass. And so because it falls in that range of um, below 40%, um, the application of the 4010 harvest policy to the California stock uh, is appropriate. So um, that would be um, something we'd ask for additional review of an alternative um, for. And I guess that's it. Um, okay, 12E. This is the non trawl RCA um, adjustment that would um, incorporate the proposal described in the NIMS report uh, regarding the authorized gears along with the gap in EC. Uh, suggestions that uh, came from their reports this meeting. Um, the intent here is for um, the, uh, or for us to preliminarily adopt as a PPA, the language in the NIMS report that does contain a further revised and narrowed scope of gear and sector definitions as part of option one that allows vessels into the commercial non trawl uh, RCA um, the gear definition meets the needs of the seabird biop and also minimizes habitat impacts while allowing the opportunity to the fixed gear and open access sector to harvest underutilized midwater rockfish. Um, appreciate the work of the gap in the EC um, in making clear that further refinements um, may be needed to the language and we do expect more work to be done between now and June by the group of uh, industry representatives, National Marine Fisheries Service, enforcement consultants and council staff um, that should um, lead us to a product uh, in June that will um, meet the needs. Um, also, they'll be working on the declaration uh, requirements and seeing uh, what amendments are needed there to uh, allow um, declaration of the gear type that's being used. Um, I just have to say that I'm so pleased to offer this motion on item 12E. It really is a keystone element of this uh, management measures package. And I don't think we can overstate its significance. Um, with the inclusion of this alternative, we um, are looking to accomplish an item that's been on our new management measures list for many years, which is to implement the Emily Platt EFP into regulations. And that is going to be a significant achievement for all of us. Um, it really, to me, serves an example as an example of how this process is supposed to work. Uh, industry has an idea of how gear can be fished to, kill, to catch healthy target stocks while avoiding overfish stocks, and they believe the gear will work. Well, they tested the idea with an EFP over a number of years, which allowed the data collection to occur, showing, in fact, that they were right. Uh, caught healthy, uh, abundant stocks of midwater rockfish and minimized um, bycatch of uh, species that um, were overfished and also bycatch of salmon. Um, and now the time has finally come to implement the EFP gear uh, in a regulation. Recognizing it's not, it doesn't go quite as far as everyone would like to go in this uh, first step of the process, but um, it is a first step and it is so significant. And so I, again, I think this is a major milestone and um, I'm pleased to, to move this forward. Um, moving to 12H, this is a new management measure and that's why it's separated out. This is the recreational bag limit change 
uh, that provides ability to take in-season actions on recreational uh, bag limits as needed. Um, this will provide more flexibility in the season setting process and allow us to effectively monitor catches and act as needed uh, to adjust bag limits. Um, as you've heard under the in-season item, CDFW is very committed to in-season monitoring and reporting of uh, quillback, copper, and of course, yellow eye rockfish, um, which is of heightened concern. So um, we have the tools to do it and um, this 12H alternative will provide us the ability to act as needed. Uh, similarly, 12I, this is the recreational uh, RCA management measures. This is the, the new concept um, that um, is, I guess you'd call the novel approach to RCA management um, that will allow for an offshore fishery um, and the ability to act in season, um, recognizing that this is, <laughs> this is a, a new management tool and we will be able to make adjustments to depth constraints and seasons as necessary uh, through our in-season management. Um, while we've received a number of comments from industry regarding safety concerns about an offshore fishery and um, difficulties with this uh, alternative and of course a preference to fish near shore rather than offshore. Um, we felt that offering this alternative and the tools to manage it in season um, would provide um, the most flexibility possible to be able to um, to prosecute uh, some ground fish fishing in times and areas where it can be done sustainably. Okay, on to trip limits for open access south and limited entry fixed gear south. Uh, the GAP and GMT concur on status quo for these measures. Um, just noting that we took action in 2022 uh, in season action rather in, in November of 21, 422 to reduce uh, impacts on quillback and copper. Um, we had a look at the initial performance in the commercial fishery um, under those new trip limits. And um, at least the initial look appears to suggest that the trip limit modifications have been met with success. We've significantly reduced our copper and quillback uh, take in the commercial sector um, while allowing for continued opportunities on other uh, deeper nearshore and nearshore stocks. Uh, we have the tools in the toolbox to make in-season adjustments uh, as needed. Um, Okay, on to number 18. This is the California Recreational um, Season Structure and Measures uh, recommending uh, to adopt as the PPA range of alternatives, the scenarios that were presented in the CDFW report under this agenda item. Um, we know that further discussion will be needed with stakeholders between now and June to inform our final action um, we also note that we anticipate discussions to continue beyond June. Uh, once we do have a final recommendation for the specifications, that's kind of not the end of the story. Um, we'll be needing to um, continuously talk about performance in the fishery over the course of 2023 and 24 um, and what modifications might be needed. Um, based on newly available fishery data and discard mortality rates or other unforeseen events that um, may occur as we uh, embark on uh, kind of a, a new and different type of management in the recreational fishery. Um, we expect at the end of the day, come June, uh, the FPA will likely be some combination of nearshore and offshore opportunities which will vary by management area uh, as described in those scenarios uh, that will aim to keep um, to the limits for copper, quillback, and yellow eye. 
Um, we've done our best with those scenarios to um, provide a range of alternatives, and I think we're we're narrowing narrowing in on um, a final FPA. Um, but we welcome additional input from the gap and uh, industry and sidebar conversations that will occur over the next few months to finalize our recommendations. Um, I think that's, that's sufficient for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Questions for the motion maker or discussion on the motion? Okay. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Call them, Bob. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I was, I had no questions. I just had a comment. Please. Okay. I think it's a long time coming. This is a great motion. I think that particularly the 12E and uh, getting people back into that RCA from the non-trawl non RCA is an important concept. The risk of beating a dead horse again, I just want to make these comments. <clears throat> in, the, in the NIMS report one for a, the, at the very end of it, the summary of revisions, it says that um, this change would ensure this ground fisher, fishers land a small amount of other species would still be allowed to fish inside the non-trawl RCA and would also be subject to the forthcoming non-trawl logbook requirement, whether fishing inside or outside the non-trawl RCA. I think that's a really uh, important component of this. I've had discussions with uh, the agency folks uh, and they said that, that they'll, they're planning to implement both of those simultaneously, the logbook as well as this. And I think it's, it's very important that we track um, the, the added interactions and discards that may accrue and have adequate oversight with that. I also had discussions about the, the very low observer coverage in those sectors. And uh, I feel confident that the observer program as well as the agency is going to revisit those and assure us that in the, it's their assessment of what is adequate, what counts here, and, I, and that they're going to revisit those numbers and let us know what is what they're if they intend to have added observer coverage or or the need for that to make sure we are uh, protecting this fishery as we move forward. So um, I just wanted to say that and wanted to add it to it, and I'll be supporting this motion. And thank you very much, Marcy, for a great motion. Okay, thank you, Bob. Further discussion, comments. Okay, and now we'll call for the question. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those no. Abstentions. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Marcy. Okay. I think we have one more motion. Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Sandra, for putting the motion up on the screen. Uh, this motion deals with item 12C, um, short belly rockfish. I move the council adopt as its preliminary preferred alternative for action item 12C and agenda item F4, supplemental revised attachment one, April 2022, amending the Pacific Coast groundfish management plan by adding the following. The council shall review fishery incurred mortality of short belly rockfish during the routinely scheduled ground fish in season agenda item. If the mortality exceeds or is projected to exceed 2000 metric tons in a calendar year, the council shall review and investigate all relevant information, including but not limited to survey abundance trends and other stock status information changes in fishing behavior, and changes in the market interest for short belly rockfish. In response to the review of the information, the Council will consider voluntary measures 
taken by the fishing industry to reduce bycatch and consider other management measures, including but not limited to area closures, gear prohibitions, bycatch limits, and seasonal restrictions as deemed necessary to reduce short belly rockfish mortality. The council may also reconsider the EC designation if appropriate. Thank you, Phil. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Very good. Thank you. Second. Second by Bob Dooley. Okay. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, this action builds on the council's previous actions to increase protection for short belly rockfish, recognizing the importance this species has in the health of the California current ecosystem. Short belly rockfish are found in waters extending from Baja, California to British Columbia. They have life history characteristics similar to other forage fish species, and they are one of the most abundant rockfish rockfishes in the California current ecosystem and are a key forage fish for many fish, birds, and marine mammal species. The need for this action is to formalize within the ground fish management plan language that requires the council to review short belly rockfish mortality if the annual fishery related mortality is projected to meet or exceed 2000 metric tons. And I recognize there's some uh, concern among some about uh, uh, this in terms of projected to meet or actually exceeding the threshold. Um, uh, but I think that uh, we need to, to, as we monitor the catch, if we see something that is expected to uh, exceed the 2000 metric ton threshold, we need to be discussing the issue early on, uh, in, particularly with industry. Since 2011, total annual mortality of short belly rockfish in West Coast fisheries has ranged from seven to 667 metric tons. So I don't anticipate the 2000 metric ton threshold to be a burden on, on fisheries that have incidental catches of short belly rockfish. The council has formally recognized the importance of maintaining healthy forage fish species in the coastal pelagic species FMP and in our fishery ecosystem plan. Specifically, the CPS FMP has a goal of providing, of quote, providing adequate forage for dependent species. End quote. Goal two in our FEP speaks to the need to, quote, conserve and manage species populations and the ecological relationship among them to realize long term benefits for marine fisheries while avoiding irreversible or long-term adverse impacts on fisheries resources and other marine environment, end quote. The threshold amount, 2,000 metric tons, is an amount that the council has used and could be changed through a subsequent FMP amendment if the council determines that it is, is either too high or too low. This amount is less than half of the most recent in the recent being 2020, ABC estimate, and approximately one third of the OFL. Setting the 2000 metric ton threshold as a level to initiate a review process is a precautionary measure that would allow the council to de develop and implement management measures in a timely manner to reduce the potential of negative impacts to the stock and or the ecosystem. The FMP amendment would also support the council's recent action to designate short belly rockfish as an ecosystem component species within the West Coast ground fish fishery management plan, recognizing its importance as forage in the California current ecosystem. In designating short belly rockfish as an EC species, uh, the, which is found in the uh, June 2019 motion that specified that, quote, the ecosystem component designation would still allow the Council and National Marine Fisheries Service to manage the species and, in a timely manner, determine whether federal management is needed pursuant to National Standard uh, 1 guidelines. 
I consider this action to be prudent, that it is proactive in protecting an important forage fish species. I want to emphasize that there is no immediate concern relative to the establishment of a directed fishery on short belly rockfish, and that the existing trawl fishery that catches short belly rockfish as a bycatch has proactively taken actions to avoid the species and has been very responsive to the council's concern regarding, regarding the avoidance of short belly rockfish. Further, I would note that the council has on its ground fish workload plan considera consideration of, the of a prohibition of a directed fishery on short belly rockfish. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, for allowing me to speak to my motion. Thank you, Phil. Questions for Phil on his uh, motion or discussion? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And thanks, Phil, for a well-crafted and fully explained motion. Uh, I was one of the ones that had a objection to the projected to exceed, but I understand now that this is just a check-in and it gives us, it's the council time to weigh in. So I'm okay with all of this. And I think uh, I feel comfortable that it gives the council a place to weigh in, consider all the facts that are relevant, including bycatch, uh, um, avoidance methods that are being employed and all of the things in, in you know, in this species, we don't understand fully. We know that the last check-in that they uh, said that there was a huge, a huge biomass, much above that. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with this and it gives us the tools we need in the toolbox to address this should we get there. So thanks Phil for all the work on this and I will be supporting it. Thank you, Bob. Further discussion? Corey Ridings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks, Phil, for this motion. Um, I support it and plan to vote for it. Um, Phil, you really covered a lot of what was on my mind, but just to add a couple things. Um, really short bill really are an important forage species. I highlight their importance to seabirds and other marine life and the ecosystem as a whole. So I think they... Um, they're worth spending a little extra time and, and thinking and protection. Um, as Phil noted, precautionary management of short belly meets council ecosystem goals under the FEP, as well as our uh, CPS management plan, um, and really supports a productive ecosystem as a whole. Uh, I want to appreciate industry action to um, avoid these short belly. Um, a little bit of what Bob just spoke to there. Um, and efforts to, to monitor and, and do good by this species. Um, that being said, I'm, I'm still in support of a need for a prohibition of a directed fishery to protect this species. Uh, this motion is a good measure um, and really appreciate Phil and all the others who've been thinking and working on this, um, but also wanted to highlight ODF and W's report and some of the work that the GMT did prior this year, um, thinking about content as well as process and I hope that we can prioritize uh, moving forward with that at some point later in the year. So thank you. Thank you, Corey. Keely, Kent, Keely. Thank you. I <clears throat> um, was debating whether to um, speak to this, but um, because I heard comments about the toolbox, I just wanted to clarify our understanding of how this FMP amendment would work um, and specifically that Currently, um, in the council's in-season toolbox, you don't have a, a tool necessarily to take action on an EC species. And so clarifying that if the council were to be thinking about um, an in-season action, um, that you may need to reconsider the EC des designation first. And I just wanted to make sure that our understanding of how this FMP amendment would work is uh, consistent with others around the table. Thank you, Keeley. Phil Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks uh, for that um, comment, Keeley. I, I, uh, it is consistent with my understanding. Um, and as I emphasized toward the end of my um, rationale to to the moving the for the motion forward is is that uh, it's my belief that the the uh, fishing industry that um, 
has uh, that encounters these fishes as uh, incidental catch are much in a much better position to uh, take action to avoid them than we are by developing regulatory measures. I don't, uh, it's not intended to mean that regulatory measures couldn't be, as, it, as the motion suggests, used. But the first line of defense in my mind, um, if you will, is, is the industry. And they don't want, our, our existing fisheries don't want to catch these fish. Uh, they, they, um, so um, I'm, I'm confident that they will continue to be proactive. Um, this puts an added emphasis on it. Uh, and um, so it is with that understanding that I put it forward, thanks. Thank you, Phil. Further discussion? Okay, I'll, I'll call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to turn to um, Todd and see how we're doing on, uh, on F4. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So the council here has passed a series of motions that um, in general associate directly with the uh, either the enhanced action item checklist or the action item checklist as it stands as attachment one, which uh, fully addresses all management measures that are before the council for this next biennium. Um, additionally, the council has directed uh, additional analyses on such things as the quillback and copper rockfish ACTs off California, um, and has also uh, put forth some more direction, giving us uh, guidance to explore 12J, which is the BACs and BRAs for spiny dogfish. Um, looking at this, I would say that you have done a great job and i would also like to say i thank mr anderson for putting forth that motion on short belly rockfish i'll note that the original language he offered in november was somehow overlooked in the larger attachment two document and for that i apologize and i do thank you for refreshing that um, language with us so with that i would say thank you very much and um, i believe you have completed this action to its uh it's where it needs to be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Great work, everyone. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to uh, Executive Director Merrick Burden to give us some uh, update on the schedule for this uh, afternoon. Merrick? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, so I have received a word on the progress of our salmon agenda item D6. Uh, I understand that um, folks should be ready to take that up at 4 p.m. So I would recommend that we stand down until 4 p.m. I have also seen a request to relax our dress code. And so since you still hold the uh, gavel, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, I think that is a question for you. Otherwise, I don't have any other updates for you. Okay, well, with that, I will uh, I will say we relax the dress codes this afternoon and uh, people are gonna go with that. And um, we'll see you back here at four. So thank you very much.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we're on D6, final action. And I'll turn to uh, Robin Elke to uh, get us going here, Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. The Salmon technical team will briefly review its analysis of the tentative management measures and answer any council questions. Final adoption of the management measures will follow the comments of the advisors, tribes, agencies, and public. Any season structure considered for adoption that deviates from the salmon fishery management plan objectives will require implementation by emergency rule. And if that appears to be necessary, the council must identify and justify the need of such action consistent with the criteria established by the council and NIMPS, which were attached in, uh, in agenda item D2. This action is for submission to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce and the final motions must be visible in writing to avoid any unnecessary delay and confusion in proposing final regulations. Minor edits may be made by the ST, may be made to the STT analysis and other documents provided by staff. Council members should be prepared to provide a written motion. So the council action today is to adopt final treaty Indian troll, non-Indian commercial and recreational ocean salmon fishery management measures for submission to the U.S. Secretary, Secretary of Commerce. And secondly, identify and justify any regulations requiring implementation by emergency rule. So your reference material today is the supplemental STT uh, report under this agenda item and any public comment uh, that may be uh, slated for you. And that concludes my summary. Thank you, Robin. Questions for Robin on her, on her overview? Okay, with that, we'll go to the SDT report and Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will be uh, referring to agenda item D6A supplemental STT report one. This report um, takes into account all the past council guidance and and the work the work of the co-managers here recently, all through this meeting and before. Um, to uh, and these the results are are herein. Um, there is only one bolded number in table five, um, and that is Hoko Fall Chinook. And we had discussed uh, the reasoning for that um, earlier in this meeting. And that concludes my presentation of these results. Okay. Questions for uh, Dr. O'Farrell on the SDT report? Okay. Thank you, Michael. All right, uh, that'll take us to the uh, tribal report. I look to uh, Joe Oatman. Joe? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, so I do have uh, one tribal report. Uh, this involves the uh, report that was submitted by the Columbia River uh, Treaty Tribes. And so I'll go ahead and uh, read this into the record. So originally, uh, it would have been Eric Holt, a member of Nesper's tribe, provided report on behalf of the four Columbia River Treaty tribes, the uh, Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs, and the Nespers. Uh, so this would be agenda item D6A, supplemental tribal report one. So as the council works to finalize this year's ocean fisheries, the tribes would like to remind everyone of a few issues important to the tribes. Hatcheries are a useful tool in many salmon recovery efforts as demonstrated by many upriver programs. Everyone is aware of the challenges in dealing with the ESA listed uh, LRH tule stock impacts and we don't seem to be using the hatchery tool effectively in efforts to recover this stock. Lower river hatcheries remain primarily just for mitigation. It is important to work on sound recovery through a wide range of actions, and it appears to the tribe that little is being done for low river tules. As a result, fisheries bear the brunt of conservation. The tribes have always advocated for dynamic recovery actions, including the appropriate use of hatcheries. 
As mentioned, our efforts uh, with snake virus fall snakes demonstrate this. However, the Columbia Basin ecosystem remains out of balance. We reminded the council of predation issues in March, but there are also issues with general river environment that benefit predators and harm salmon. High summer water temperatures and excessive nutrients in the Columbia River have caused increase in abundance of aquatic vegetation, much of which is non-native. This vegetation interferes with tribal fisheries and impacts the food chain for our salmon steelhead. Siltation has also become a concern. Many tributary mouths are filling in because of silt is not transported downstream due to the hydro system. Shallow river mouths leave juvenile fish subject to high levels of predation and make it difficult for adults to enter tributaries at lower flows. Funding will be needed for dredging and other restoration efforts around river mouths. In this modified environment, introduced fish species such as walleye and bass can thrive and threaten another first food, juvenile lamprey. There are, there are also other introduced organisms that we know little about, such as Siberian prawns, and there continue to be threats from invasive mussels that are found regularly with inspections on boats coming from other parts of the country. If we care about salmon, steelhead, and lamprey, we must do more to restore a properly functioning environment for these fish. Dam building in the Columbia Basin began with dams and diversions in the tributaries in the late 1800s. These early dams, along with mines, logging, and grazing, destroyed and blocked fish habitat. With the construction of large mainstem dams beginning early 1900s, people turned to hatcheries to mitigate loss production. Even though promises continued to be made to the tribes that they would always have fish, the majority of early mitigation hatcheries were constructed downstream of Bonneville Dam. Tribal fisheries are place-based fisheries within the tribe's regional custom fishing areas. Village sites and spawning grounds have been lost, which displace tribal people and the fish. Tribal fishers don't have the opportunity to move around like sport fishers who can fish anywhere from the Pacific Ocean to Idaho. We depend on fish re returning to our areas to provide for our needs. Ocean fisheries need to be managed conservatively to ensure enough fish return to tribal fishing areas and to meet escapement needs. Although we remain committed to the idea that hatcheries can be used as a critical part of the recovery strategy, many of our hatchery programs are underfunded and many hatcheries have been poorly maintained. Promises made to tribes by the federal officials that we would always have hatchery fish include the need to maintain hatcheries. As we work on the nation's infrastructure, we should remember the infrastructure needs of the salmon. This means not only dealing with the needs of hatcheries, which serve as recovery tools and produce fish for harvest, but also remembering that improving habitat can also be considered infrastructure. As we make important strides in addressing various habitat concerns, we must remember that habitat restoration is complex, expensive, and time consuming. It is critical work and more funding and support are needed. With that, that concludes my reading of the uh, statement. Thank you, Joe. Questions for Joe on the tribal report? Okay, thank you. That takes us to public comment, and I believe there's no cards in. I'm getting the uh, no sign, so that brings us to uh, council action. So I'm gonna open the floor for the discussion first, and then uh, different guidance or for motions. So, call addicts. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. As Dr. O'Farrell mentioned during the STT report, there was one bolded value left in our um, projected escapement for Hoko Fall Chinooks, and we had a discussion on that the other day, but I just wanted to say a few more things about it. The Hoko Summer Fall Run Chinook stock is managed in council area and in northern fisheries, subject to the provisions of the Council Salmon Fishery Management Plan and the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Under the council's FMP, Hoko Chinook salmon are managed for a spawning escapement of 850 naturally spawning adults. The forecast of Hoko Chinook salmon in 2022 is, is for an escapement of 940 adult Chinook in the absence of all fishing. With the northern fisheries that are expected to occur within the limits identified in the Pacific Salmon Treaty, the spawning escapement is projected to be at a level below the escapement goal. Escapement in the last five years has averaged 1,726, ranging from 1,188 to 2,179, consistently higher than the escapement goal. 
Section 3.3.6.2 of the FMP notes that some de minimis level of fishing impacts are allowed by the provisions of the PST at low abundance levels. For Chinook salmon, this is referring to the individual stock-based management obligations under the PST, specifically the stock-specific exploitation rate limits when stocks are not meeting their management objectives. Under the provisions of the PST, Hoko Chinook are managed to an exploitation rate limit of 10% in southern United States fisheries. As reported in Table 5 of the STT report, the model results project a southern U.S. exploitation rate on HOCO of 2.1%, of which 1.9% is occurring in council area fisheries, well below the 10% PST limit. This represents, represents a level of fishery impact in council area fisheries that is below the levels defined as de minimis for other Chinook salmon stocks in the FMP. For example, Klamath River Fall Run Chinook at 25% and Sacra Sacramento River Winter Run Chinook at 20%. WDFW and the treaty tribe support the fishery management measures proposed here that would lead to a projected escapement for Hoko Chinook of 735 adult spawners. Salmon fishery impacts on Hoko Chinook salmon associated with the fisheries under consideration by the council in 2022 are consistent with the limits required by the PST and with the provisions of the Pacific Coast Salmon Fishery Management Plan. Thank you Kyle for that clarification information. Okay. Anyone else before we go to motions? Butch Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I would like to uh, piggyback kind on to the tribal uh, report. I think it's important to bring to the council's attention um, some Thule issues um, and remind the, the council a little bit of, of history. Back in 2011, the council um, passed the two matrix um, it's a council sponsored um, exercise and bringing everybody into the room under Don Agaizik and we had Bob Turner and uh, Noah Fisheries and we had the tribes both um, confederated tribes of the Columbia River and uh, coastal tribes uh, participate in that um, and through that process um, you know there was expectations of uh, production expectations of uh, over a hundred years, you would have, you know, the, the different percentages of boxes that you went in. It was actually one of the best salmon processes I think the council ever, ever did and bringing everybody together, the states of Washington, uh, Mr. Anderson was director and, and Kurt Melcher provided Steve Williams and, and Chuck, Chuck Tracy was the, was the salmon uh, officer back then. And, uh, you know, and everybody entered that room with their, sleeves rolled up and and worked and pulled in, in the same direction it, it didn't you know take three or four years it it was done in a relatively short time with lots of meetings and and stuff it was like i said and so um and, and of course in 2016 you you have you know you have to make sure that you don't have uh hatchery fish and wild fish you know messing around so um 2016 barry tom you know wrote a letter and and warned and warned everybody that, that there would have to be some cuts if we didn't, um, you know, remove hatchery fish from from certain rivers in the states. Of course, money never never flows as you make these plans. It you know it's got to catch up and and the state of Washington and I believe probably the state of Oregon. But I'm speaking for Washington or speaking on Washington side anyway. I'm not speaking for Washington, but uh, you know had to get weirs and, and do different plans to remove those fish. And, and uh, you know, that they're still working on that to this day. And, and, but, but those cuts came, you know, to the tune of uh, um, about 7 million from the expected um, expected what we were could raise to make the, the, the plan work. And, and now we're, we're just viewing probably what uh, things to come. If, if we don't, you know, get back in that room, not necessarily as a council sponsored um, project, but uh, sit down in that room again and, and figure out where we can, you know, raise some fish. Uh, we, we know we've got some stuff out there, but, you know, for example, that, you know, 7 million cut is about 28,000 returning adults to the, to the river mouth. And uh, if we had those 28 million fish returning to the river mouth, we wouldn't even have been had a Thule problem this year. We would have been in the 41% box. And, and like the tribe said, it's, you know, um, 
uh, hatcheries are part of the solution to 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 recovery and and uh, and you know to coastal communities and tribal communities and in the river and, and and plus you know in that meantime we we had you know the council sponsored the orca whale task force um these fish these tules go all the way up to southeast alaska and graze off of vancouver island which are important for you know orca orca survival and and that's one thing we didn't have uh, to deal with back in 16 or before didn't realize you know until that uh we, we realize now um, that uh, orcas aren't dying of obesity, you know, they're dying of starving to death. And so, um, uh, you know, we've, and so anyway, I just wanted to point out that, that I think it's, it's time that we probably should get back together and, and, and figure out what we're, what we're going to do here or, or this is, uh, you know, this, 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 this Thule year might look like a fantastic Thule year in history. Um, cause when, if we go down into those 35 and 33 and 32% boxes, um, you think it was painful this year. Uh, it, 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 you, you haven't seen pain like that. And, and I think, uh, you know, uh, we recognized it back in 2011 that, um, that, uh, you know, when we, when we do the right things and, and, uh, do our conservation goals and needs and that we're able to, um, uh, fish a little harder when the when the abundance is good and have to sit on the dock when when abundance isn't as good and and everybody that i that i work with in the salmon side um uh have always agreed to that always been conservation minded and and i think it's uh i think we owe it to the tribes and and the, and the, and the coastal communities and and uh and everybody concerned that we um maybe seriously take a look at what we're doing and and see if we can find some room for to get that production back closer to what that plan called for i if you haven't read that plan it, it really you know we used the model on other matrices since um and uh um you know so i i think that uh i know uh, no, I think would certainly be willing to sit down. I think the state of Washington and, and state of Oregon would be willing to sit down and see where we can, where we can come together and, and find, find space and, and recognize that, you know, we also have a new player in the room that we want to take care of. And, and, uh, anyway, um, and our tribal and our tribal co-managers and, and all those that want to participate and will participate again, I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, I, I know the macaws participated in that process. You know, there's been, uh, since 2011, there's, you know, a few brain cells and a lot less hair that I have. So I've, I've forgot some of the participants, but, but anyway, I, I know it was, uh, it was, uh, like I said, a really good process. I don't want to take any more time, but I, I just want to let, let, uh, this council know that this, um, this is probably an urgent, urgent problem that we need to expedite and sit down and and really and and think outside the box so thank you for the time um, and the discussion and and i just wanted to put that out there and and let people know i think it's time we sit back down again and and revisit the the tule matrix the beam store for plan uh, whatever and uh, what a great scientist to work with too so anyway thank you very much thank you much okay gentlemen thank you mr vice chair Wanted to speak to really briefly to the uh, statement that uh, Kyle Addicts provided on the uh, Hoku um, Chinook salmon. As I, I do want to confirm that the uh, Treaty Tribe do um, support the fishery management measures as uh, reflected uh, in his statement. Um, you know, we do think that um, this is consistent with the uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty as well as uh, our salmon uh, FMAP. I would think that, you know, given uh, the circumstances involved here relative to the uh, forecast, the fisheries that catch Hoku Chinook uh, salmon stock and the spawning escaping objective, that this is an acceptable approach. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Well, uh, I'll look to Washington to start us off on the uh, on our motions. Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a motion which should pop up on the screen. Thank you. 
I move that the council adopt for submission to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce the non-Indian commercial and recreational salmon management measures for the area north of Cape Falcon as presented in agenda item D6A, Supplemental STT Report 1, dated April 12th, 2022. Thank you, Kyle. Is the language accurate on the screen? It is. Second by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Speech or motion, uh, Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Every year, the, the North of Falcon process seems to take a unique set of twists and turns. Um, this year, I, we actually got our North of Falcon work with the co-managers done pretty quickly, but we had to spend a lot of time resolving the, the Thule issue that we talked about a lot earlier in the week. Mm -hmm. So thanks to the council for their patience um, on the agenda each day and allowing us that extra check in this morning so we could finish our work and, and be back here. Um, I think the, the set of fisheries um, before the council are the best we could do with the with the situation we were in. A lot of hard work by the SAS to, to get to a package that, that gets the most out of the fisheries for our coastal communities. Um, a lot of hard work by the, the USV Washington co-managers to meet all of those inside objectives that we struggle to meet every year. Um, so thanks to the, the salmon technical team and all the um, state, federal, and tribal staff that have worked hard the, over the past couple of months. Thanks to the SAS for working through some really difficult issues this week. And um, thanks to my colleagues to the South for helping us um, figure out how to get this package on the table this week. Very good. Um, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, you know, we, we um, wait um, here in the council room for these products to be brought to us. And um, sometimes we're, we're not mindful of all the work that's being done behind the scenes by a lot of people to, to get the product that comes in front of us here. And, and I just think it's important for us to stop here for a moment and recognize all the people that contributed. Um, I know WDFW, for example, had like 25 staff members here all week, including the director. Um, I, I particularly wanted to call out um, Kyle Attix. Um, uh, he's been leading the development of a new Puget Sound Resource Management Plan that they just, they with the co-managers, it's going to hopefully, once it's approved, it's going to give us uh, multi-year coverage under the Endangered Species Act and get out of this year-by-year -year consultation business. And he's also been the, the, the leader uh, for Washington uh, throughout this process, this uh, during this North Balkan process, and has just done a really outstanding job. So I just wanted to thank and recognize Kyle for that. Thank you, Phil. Anyone else? Okay. With that, I'm going to call for the motion. So, all those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Motion passed unanimously. Okay. Moving down to uh, tribal tribes. Joe. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I do have a motion ready. And if uh, Sandra can put it up on the screen. I move to adopt the Treaty Indian Troll Fishery Management Measures for submission to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce for the area north of Cape Falcon as shown in Table 3 on Agenda Item D6A, Supplemental SCT Report 1, April 12, 2022. Thank you, Joe. Is the language accurate on the screen? It is. Okay, Mr. seconded by Kyle Attix. Thank you, Kyle. Speak to your motion, please, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I, I, I too want to um, acknowledge all the work of the SCT and the many others who've uh, helped uh, get us here uh, today. I uh, know that's some difficult work, um, takes quite a bit of time and, and do appreciate those efforts. Um, to relative to the tribes, uh, so the tribes have been engaged in the North of Falcon process to work out the management measures that are being proposed here for adoption. Uh, these tribes have federally recognized fishing rights that must be addressed as other applicable law here in the PFMC process. 
The 2022 projected abundance of salmon and coho stocks, uh, their corresponding management objectives, uh, determine how much fish can be available for tribal fisheries. As is the case each year as we go through this process, uh, the projected abundances of these fish present unique stock specific challenges to shaping treaty troll ocean fisheries, among others under consideration in North of Falcon. These considerations are complex and reaching agreed to treaty troll management measures is a challenging process. I commend the tribes, state of Washington, uh, WDFW, NOAA Fisheries, for having the discussions necessary and making choices they have along the way to get us uh, to this point where these table three management measures for the treating and troll fisheries can be acted upon by us today. There are other tribal fisheries that occur on inside areas that are critically important as well. The tribes have stressed over the years that recovery of these vital fishery resources cannot be achieved by these management measures alone. They do their part in setting harvest measures through this PFMC process. They continue to call for a broader, more comprehensive effort to rebuild these runs that the tribes have relied upon and depend upon as part of their federally protected treaty rights. So with that, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair, um, that concludes my points. Thank you, Joe. Discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Thanks, Joe. Uh, next up, we'll Oregon and Chris Kern. Chris? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll wait a moment for the motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, I move that the council adopt the non-Indian commercial and recreational salmon management measures for submission to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce for the area from Cape Falcon, Oregon to the Oregon-California border as presented in agenda item D6A, Supplemental SDT Report 1, dated April 12, 2022. Thank you, Chris. Is the language accurate on the screen? Yes. Seconded by <laughs> Krista Swinson. Thank you, Krista. Okay. Speak to your motion, uh, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll, I'll try and be as brief as I can, given the time. But uh, I do want to reflect on a really hard week, but also process this year. Um, I don't want to belabor it because we've talked about it a fair bit already. But um, as we as we wrap things up here, we know uh, people have put in a huge amount of work, both the technical team and the advisors, and I can't thank either one of them enough. I mentioned the workload on the technical staffs the other day, but I was remiss in not reflecting on the workload the SAS puts in, which is frankly similar in my view. They're working their tails off here um, and uh, had a hard row um, this year, uh, as we've all talked about. So uh, I apologize when I complain about things and don't have solutions, it bothers me, but, but I have you know raised some issues that I'm concerned about, others are concerned about that I don't have solutions for. We, I feel like we have the tools and know how to deal with changes in stock abundance and status and things, but uh, we are relying on the tools we have. And we've run into some complexities with those uh, this go round. I think I said as well the other day, I don't think this is gonna get easier over the long haul in terms of the ways we have to manage and plan for fisheries. I think they're gonna get more complex, not less complex. And so I, I do, you know, does leave me with concerns for the long haul about how we maintain a sustainable um, process for the tools and the people and the fish um, through what we do. Um, so uh, I think that's all I'd have to say. Um, and again, I don't have solutions, but I for all the partners, uh, the states and tribes and the advisors and everybody in the process. And thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing no hands, I'll, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. 
abstentions. Motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Chris. Moving to California, Marcy Remco. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And Sandra, motion for California. Thank you. I move that the council adopt the non-Indian commercial and recreational salmon management measures for submission to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce for the area from the Oregon-California border to the U.S.-Mexico border as presented in agenda item D6A, supplemental STT report one, dated April 12, 2022. Thank you, Marcy. Is the language of the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Seconded by... Mark, uh, Chair Gorelnik. Okay, Marcy, please speak to your motion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, we, we came into this management cycle facing a somewhat different set of circumstances than we've seen in recent years in that the tools that we typically rely on to assess stock status and fishery impacts weren't producing the results that um, we had expected. Um, and unfortunately, um, we're out of alignment with our FMP management goals and our ESA conservation objectives. Uh, and that's based on the postseason review of our fishery performance uh, over the past several years. Um, because of the situation, um, we had to um, face some pretty difficult decisions uh, with our partners and uh, with our SAS as leadership um, to make some pretty um, difficult and draconian uh, recommendations to cut fishing time uh, to ensure that our salmon seasons would align uh, with the ESA and the FMP. The most significant of those constraints, at least for California, was the uh, the updated guidance uh, from National Marine Fishery Service that we received uh, first before and then clarified during the March meeting uh, to target a new harvest rate for age four Klamath Fall Chinook. And that guidance was to revise the preseason rate cap down to 10% from 16%, uh, which we've been managing to preseason uh, in the past. Um, so the constraint uh, results in some significant loss of time on the water, particularly for California's commercial trollers, which are the, the fleets that most likely encounter those uh, age four Klamath Fall Chinook. Um, Across all of our California management areas, uh, there are 66 less fishing days on the water compared to last year. And you might recall that last year wasn't particularly good. Um, in 2020, we had 268 open days. 2021, we were at 184. And now for 2022, we're looking at 118. Um, so this is looking like a very painful uh, year for the industry. Um, kind of as Chris indicated, um, I wish I could be more optimistic about uh, what the future might hold, uh, at least off California. Um, the future environmental conditions don't look great. Um, while um, the ocean um, situation um, might look favorable. California is entering its third hot and dry year with increasing frequency of fires, low reservoirs, water flows, and um, correspondingly high water temperatures and below average snowpack. And while the, the ocean does look somewhat favorable, the growing abundance of northern anchovy in the near shore ocean waters um, and the relative abundance of copepods give some good reason for optimism. The threat of thiamine deficiency also still looms. So um, I uh, feel like, you know, things are probably not going to get easier in the near term, um, but I am 
uh, looking forward to the STT's work over the next few months and the report that they'll bring to us uh, in June after their initial looks uh, uh, look into some concerns with the KOHM and what might be done to improve some of the unrealistic outputs. Um, and so with that, I'd just like to thank the, the SAS and the STT um, for their continuing work, and now we've added more to their plate, um, but they are very critical in uh, helping us um, develop the path forward. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, discussion on the motion? Okay, I'll call for the questions. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Maybe I should open the floor if there's any other council business, the Humphrey and Jim item that we need to bring up. But he has anything. Butch Smith? You know, um, just want to say this real quick. With all the uh, hard work from, you know, SAS under Richard Heap's leadership and, uh, you know, all the tribes and everybody that co-manage that participate in Washington and, and stuff, it, I think one person that sometimes we forget to, to thank is uh, Robin Elke. She really ties and, and uh, has to wrangle a lot of different personalities uh, she even had to wrangle me for a few years, and that's not, that's not an easy job. And and uh, I want to thank her too. So don't 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 forget our staff officers because they work very hard. So thank you, Robin. Absolutely, but just a, there's a lot of great people in this process. That's for sure. With that, Robin, I turn to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, so for agenda item D6, will you adopted the final regulations for the 2022 salmon season? Sorry, I can't say it without a smile. <laughs> you guys did an awesome job. Thank you to everybody. I think your work here is done. And I just have to thank the council for providing the staff that um, populate those advisory bodies in the STT. You all have some fantastic people working behind you, and it is definitely um teamwork and it it takes it takes a family it takes a village but thank you okay thank you robin um yeah great job everyone and with that i want to turn uh, the gavel back over to our chairman Mark. thank you vice chair pratt and chair yeah great job by everyone and i think it was great having the salmon folks here in person i think that really facilitated progress on some really tough, tough issues. And I guess tomorrow we'll talk about what, what June holds for us. But that completes our business for the day. So I'll see if our executive director, Merrick Burden, has any announcements or perhaps a preview of tomorrow's business. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I would also, I guess, echo uh, the thanks and appreciation for all the hard work. It's impressive to watch you all, um, everyone here and everybody on our advisory bodies and in the public uh, participate in this process. It's my first time through a salmon process and it, um, it it's impressive to watch you all work through these very uh, difficult issues. Um, tomorrow, um, we have two uh, matters on our agenda. Um, one concerning our council operating procedures and membership appointments. And then we have future council meeting agenda and workload planning. Um, maybe give you a preview in case you want to think about that uh, over the evening, um, the future council meeting agenda. We are um, at this point planning on a full in-person meeting in June. So maybe give that some thought because that will take a bit of discussion tomorrow, potentially. Um, otherwise you should have some updated um, uh, year at a glance and um, June council meeting agenda in the briefing book. Um, so maybe take a look at that also. Other than that, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any further uh, comments. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone. Um, we'll see everyone tomorrow morning and hopefully um, get through that business as, as efficiently as we got through the rest of the business in this meeting. So have a good evening.